Sarah Good morning. Can you state your full name and date of birth for the record? For us? Sarah Boone, 10, 10, 7, 7. Ms. Boone is seated at council's table wearing a black blazer and a dark blue blouse. She is in custody. However, she is not in any restraints, so we will continue to stand uh, while the jury panel enters and exits. My understanding is that our panel is here uh, this morning. State, do we have any housekeeping matters we need to address before we bring back in our panel? <laughs> yes, sir. Um, three discovery issues, and then I filed a motion late last night requesting to move camera uh, inquiry into a potential conflict of interest. Uh, okay. I did review the motion. Three discovery issues. Mm -hmm. uh, one, on October 5th, or October 4th, I believe uh, the defense was provided with um, the body one camera 911 calls from prior incidents. Uh, and was a request made to uh, tell us what anything should be redacted from their point of view so that we could either reach agreement or use the court resources to decide in conflicts with those issues. Uh, yesterday morning was the first uh, actual response I got from the defense team that was incomplete. Uh, it was about three of the five incidents. Um, I do agree with two um, of the redactions um, and that we are getting taken care of. But obviously, just like connecting to the court screen, uh, it takes time. And I'm not the person who's going to be doing it. Somebody else in the office has to do it. Um, the third incident, I think, we're still uh, not on the same page as it was the state's plan had introduced. Um, so I resent the email with screenshots of what the files of the state plan I'm introducing to the defense team again this morning. Uh, I have not heard anything yet from uh, the defense team about the fourth or fifth incident. I was told that Attorney Beck was going to handle it. It is now Tuesday, day seven of the trial. He has not handled it. Um, the second discovery issue is. Um, Friday, I've been a hard copy of 119 pages of the second copy of the Winter Park Advent Health from 1018. Uh, October 18th. That would have been the preceding Friday. Um, I was given a hard copy uh, after court at about 5 45. I emailed the PDF of those records back to the defense as they requested. I put Bates numbers on them. Um, I understand from court what pages they indicated that they want to use and what pages indicated to be included at the state for pages 26 and 48 out of the 111. Well, uh, I would appreciate if I could get uh, a copy of the intended exhibit as it shall be introduced to the court so I can confirm those things ahead of time, not in court. Um, and then the third thing is, I believe we had a discussion about the uh, plethora of pages regarding the victims of uh, hospital records. And that there was some sort of discussion we had that they were to narrow it down. Uh, and I have not been given any narrowed down version of that so that we can confirm we're on the same page or use the court's time to build a conflict. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> Responses to the first discovery issue regarding body worn camera and 911 calls as to the, my understanding, five prior incidents. Defense. <laughs> Speak to three of them. There were three of them that I reviewed, and I believe I reviewed them on Sunday. I had made the I had made the decision for what I thought needed to be redacted. I think close to if I remember correctly, I said that was my reviewing reactions to it. I think it's one that I said reactions to, and I think the state agreed with that. The specific one that I can quite them, and I think that has to do with uh, a body cam when it comes to, and I believe it's uh, Mr. Torres's mother's eye cam. But she 
he's being asked and he's asked questions at all. I think it's about to be, if I can recall correctly, about Mr. Mm-hmm. Mr. Short, where I was at that time. I didn't so it's not bad at that time. Uh, but that was the only part of that to let the state know. I just don't know. It could come in at a different point in the time. But as to be up to, I think we were up to okay. Um, I did not feel that day it was late. Uh, and I asked Mr. Beck to do the other two actions. But I had to talk to him about that. So that's what we did. So the third incident that the state has identified for which there's no res- seemingly no responses to redaction is that the body worn camera purportedly between law enforcement and Mr. Torres's mother? That's what I believe it to be. Um, Mr. J. Which is not on the same page. Um, on that third incident, uh, which I believe it was June 15th of 2019, um, the state only indicated them through and introduced one video file. It is not of victim's mother. Um, it is of that at Sarah Cruz's house um, in the field. The objection to the files that they were objecting to, but we don't see the introduced just an ID. I don't, I don't know that as a legally recognized objection, so I was I'm confused. I'm not sure. I'm just trying to make sure we're all on the same page. We understand which file the state wants to use regarding the third incident, because he's described the file the state does not use. The first couple of incidents, we agree there's a 911 call that seemingly cuts off into a little D call at three minutes and one seconds. We're cutting that to the end. The second uh, one, uh, Ms. Boone at like three minutes and four three seconds in the case that she had been arrested, she had been arrested with fire. Um, so we can cut that out. We're going to cut that out. Too. That cuts out that. Um, so what we're looking for now is just making sure we're all on the same page about the third incident. Um, I, I sent screenshots of the tool called Sniffing Tool from Windows. I literally create a rectangle around the files that I'm intending to use, their file size, and the, the folder that includes the OCSO agency case number incident, so we can be as crystal clear as possible. And I'm still getting objections about things we don't want to introduce on that uh, incident, and I've gotten no response of before the fifth incidents. Right. Addressing the third incident is the specific portions of the June 15, 2019 incident, seemingly the um, body one camera that you're making reference to, Mr. Henderson, the state has no intention of utilizing. Yes. And just, just it, it's a lot. So if I can have one sure. to ask for what this incident is. <laughs> That's not the one. I understand. I understand the state is talking about the third incident. That would be June 18th. I sent these, um, I sent these pictures over with OCSO case number, and then I get a response based on incident dates. So we have to kind of cross reference. Um, so, just to make the record entirely clear OCSO incident 18 067501. Um, there was no 911 calls, and apparently, no objection. So they have no redaction request in the 2018 case. Then the next response was 6 15 2019 case. And that, for the record, is OCSO 19 054 917. Their request on that one was the 911 call that we uh, just discussed, indicating uh, that at 351, well, I had to find it, 351. Um, it turns into another case and to redact that to the end. We agreed. Video three in that file, again, no file name, um, indicates at 940 to 943, there's a, re- 
a redact request with a friend previous arrest. The state agrees to that. We heard, we heard her quickly say that at 943, and we will get that taken care of. Then their next response was 618, 2019 case, which I have cross-referenced back to show that it is OCSO 19-055572. And in that particular case, uh, what I sent them was a screenshot that includes the OCSO case number 19055572, and it indicates there is an intent by the state to introduce two 911 calls and one video file labeled axon underscore flex underscore two underscore video underscore 2019 dash 06 dash 18 underscore 1330. My response that I received from them was video three in file two minutes seven seconds to two minutes 18 seconds paren ID and then video four in file two minutes and four seconds to two minutes and 16 seconds paren ID. Um, so my confusion lies in I did not um, indicate three or four files, which is one file. And then again, with the other two. I don't want to address one five yet. Okay. My understanding there's no response. We'll, we'll address that momentarily. Responses to the clarification as to what it is the state seeks for incident three. No. Okay. Right. With regard to incidents four and five. Mr. J, can you place on the record what it is specifically as to those incidents the state may be seeking to introduce? Yes, sir. So, what we're calling incident number four should be OCSO 19 078 009, August 28, 2019. We indicated the desire uh, to use axon underscore flex underscore two underscore video underscore 2019 dash zero eight dash two eight underscore two zero two four. And then at their request, they had desired to get photos of Ms. Boone's injuries from that case. There is a 19 page PDF file. Uh, which has pictures taken by law enforcement of her injuries. Um, I don't see anything else in there. Uh, one picture of Mr. Torres, a couple of pictures of Mr. Torres, but nothing that the state was objecting to. Um, so that was at their request that they wanted photographs um, in. So that is incident four, which is labeled OCSO 19-078-009. With regard to seemingly the body worn camera that the state seeks to enter into evidence from August 28, 2019, what say the defense? <laughs> no, I don't know about it. The state is on this very different portion of this video at the very end of this very first book. Is the state seeking any redactions? I'm just clarifying what their redaction requests are in that particular file. Okay. They don't have anything. So are there any redaction requests with regard to that particular that particular file? Okay. I'm just keep investing in on the wall. <laughs> No, uh, that's a closed action of the press card. I, I do want to point out that we were apparently live yesterday to say we're only going to use a uh, third video possible. And so we have to spend a whole lot of time working on the citizens. Let me clarify some what the fifth incident is, just so that we're all on the same playing field. Judge, the fifth incident is OCSO 19-079-759, that was uh, on September 4th, 2019. Within that screenshot uh, that I sent to them,
Friday, and then we sent it this morning. Um, was photographs of the defendant taken at that time at their request. Shows a cut from her ear. It's three photographs. Then there is also one body worn camera labeled 192475. I'll strike that. 192473549 underscore G E N underscore I N B. And then the 911 call from that incident. Any reaction sought by the defense with regard to that specific body worn camera or 911 call? Or necessarily seeking reaction. However, there are two separate videos. One seems to focus on for Victoria, one seems to focus on uh, Ms. Boone, and there is. Two videos of the state seeking. Uh, there's one, the one that I used to find. Okay. Do you know if that's a. Bruce, can you find out what the council's here for? Is that the video from the perspective of, uh, as identified by Mr. Beck, one more geared towards Ms. Boone, or one more geared towards Mr. Torres? Um. My interpretation of both of them is there's interactions uh, with Ms. Spoon, and then there is interactions with Mr. Torres upstairs after he's located. Mr. Beck, the specific file number was identified. So just to confirm, no redactions. Okay. All right. So just as a recap, with regard to the first incident, the 911 call, parties have agreed to redactions at the timestamp of 351 towards the end. With regard to the second, um, Incident, body-worn camera, redaction from timestamp 940 to 943 has been agreed to. With regard to the June 15, 2019 incident and the 2911 call, one body-worn camera, sought by the state to which the defense has no redactions. The August 8, 2019 incident for which there is no redactions to the body-worn camera, but there is a 19-page PDF with photos that the defense intends to be included with that submittal to which the state has no objection. As to the fifth event, uh, three photos of the defendant, uh, body worn camera, and 911 call for which there are no redactions. Does that clarify everything for the state? Thank you. Is there anything that I uh, stated incorrectly, Mr. Beck, Mr. Henderson, or Mr. Owens? No. Okay, thank you very much. Moving to the next issue with regard to the 119 pages uh, from Winter Park. Um, defense are you in a position to provide, I believe we discussed it either Friday or I think it was last week, we discussed it as to the, how it was culled down. Yes, because we had the Richardson hearing on Friday. How that list was culled down, the additional pages that the state was seeking, and then if they were able to find, I believe it was page 68, we would readdress that. Have you provided that finalized uh, exhibit to the defense as to those specific one part health records from the 119 pages that the defense may be seeking to enter into evidence. Uh, we may be seeking to seek evidence from the Congress, identify those uh, that were not specifically addressed by the defense. Uh, the state wanted to uh, send out a ruling to speak this. I don't believe it. But my understanding from Mr. Jay was that they were looking for the tangible copy of what it is that you were actually looking to, to move in. Those 12, 14, 15 pages. Okay, if you could provide that to them by noon, I would appreciate it. But if it's going to be moved into evidence, we have the, I mean, is it going to be moved in in paper form, or is it going to be moved in in digital by virtue of a CD? Okay, perfect. Just get it to the state. It doesn't have to be intangible. Just get down what it is that you are. If it's an electronic format, that's fine. So the state should be entitled to know what it is that y'all are intending to move out of those pages just to confirm it. Uh, lastly, with regard to um, 
hospital records of the victim. Um, I know there were conversations and discussions about that list being narrowed down. State has advised that details of those narrowed down records has not yet been provided. Let's say the defense. The hospital records for the victim will be for it. That's my understanding. We need to do that, Judge. We have to do that. Okay. My understanding is that the experts are potentially teed up to testify tomorrow. I don't recall if those records are a basis of the experts' opinions. So the second expert is not likely to testify until Thursday. She's uh, testifying in Bay County tomorrow. I can figure Thursday. I spoke with Dr. Brandon last night. He's going to be tomorrow morning. Did either doctors Brandon or Harper rely on those medical records? Yeah, uh, uh, yeah, Dr. Harper did. It's in uh, it's in her deposition that was taken a couple of weeks ago. Questions, uh, Ms. Price. Good morning. If you were here for pretrial nineteen alpha, Judge Myers is covering. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> you may continue. You've got till the 5 p.m. today to advise the state as to what of those called down records you're going to be utilizing. So they have the opportunity to review those in advance of Dr. Harper testifying. Any other issues we need to address with regard to the discovery issues that you brought to the court's attention this morning? No, sir. Okay. All right. Moving now to the motion. I have reviewed that motion. Um, um, Judge, we were not aware of the motion until you made mention of it, so I need some time for the lawyers to review it, for us to discuss it, and to see whether or not it has merit or not. Okay. It was e-filed last night, looks like 9.37, and then sent courtesy copy of myself through Ms. Berrios and you, Ms. Rowans, at 9.38 last night. I'll give the opportunity to review that. We can address it after the lunch hour, and I'll give the court the opportunity to do any research during the lunch hour on it as well. All right, anything else, Mr. Jay? That I, I looked at it briefly. I'm not sure exactly what the allegation is. So I don't know if we need to talk about that. Okay. Excuse me. I, I, I'm not here for this. Sure, come on up, Bill.
All right, thank you all very much. With regard to that motion, uh, we're going to table that for now and address it potentially this afternoon. Uh, state is advised they're ready to proceed. Uh, Mr. Jay shook his head yes. In fact, you ready to proceed? Mr. Owens, you ready to proceed, sir? Yes. Thank you. Right. Ms. Booth, are you still satisfied with your lawyer's representation of you in this matter? Absolutely. Are you still on board with the strategy that they have employed in the use uh, of your defense? Yes. All right. Let's go ahead and stand and bring in our panel. Seated. Thank you. Members of our jury, good morning. Welcome back to 12 Alpha of the Orange County Courthouse. Uh, thank you again for your time, your attention, and your sacrifice in this matter. Uh, just by a show of hands, if you could confirm that you complied with court's instructions last night. The record will reflect all juror members have raised their hands. State, if you could please recall Detective Kepsel. State would uh, call Detective Kepsel. Ma'am, good morning again. Can you state and spell your name for the record? Yes. My name is Chelsea Kepsel, C H E L S E Y K O T P S E L. Mr. Capstory, you may proceed. Your Honor, we have tendered the witness to the defense. Okay, thank you. Mr. Anderson, you may proceed with any cross examination. Good morning, ma'am. Good morning. Now, it's my understanding that on February 24th, 2020, you responded to this crime scene. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, were you the first officer to respond to the crime scene? No. So there were other officers who were there prior to you arriving. Is that correct? Yes. Were you the first detective to respond to the crime scene? Uh, my, myself and my partner, we all arrived at the same time because we left from the same location at the same time. Okay, who is your partner now? Detective Scott Lowen. And uh, so, and do, throughout the whole time, you and uh, Detective Lowen worked on this case together, is that correct? Yes, he assisted me with this case. Now, when you arrived on the 24th, uh, how many, approximately, how many other officers were there? Uh, including, like, Deputy sheriffs, like in uniform? Yes. Yes. Oh. Um, approximately four, maybe, I would assume. Had, had it been designated a crime scene at that time? And had tape or security measures been taken to protect us? Yes, they yeah. have. Uh, so that had already been done by the time that you had gotten separate. Yes, that's correct. Now, in the investigation, one of your um, for what you're trying to accomplish in the investigation is basically get a basics 
of what took place. Would you agree with me there? Yes, sir. All right. And you could do that one or two ways, or, or a combination of this. One is to take testimony of potential witnesses. Is that correct? Yes, sir. All right. Uh, this day, did you in fact do that? Yes, I did. And one of those potential witnesses was uh, Sarah Boone, is that correct? Yes, it was. She took the statement from Sarah Boone because we've all seen it, is that correct? Yes, we have. And at that point in time, uh, Ms. Boone did not have to talk to you if she didn't want to. But she didn't. No, she did not. So she agreed to talk to you at that point in time? Yes, she did. Okay. Uh, were there any other witnesses besides Ms. Boone that you talked to on this initial day of the 24th? Just right then. And Mr. Boone told you what? Uh, you had a chance to talk to him. He told you his involvement. Is that correct? That's correct. And in fact, was it Mr. Boone's uh, testimony? Was that recorded too? I conducted an audio recording, yes. Uh, is that standard procedure when you do your interviews to try to record the interviews? Yes. What's the benefit of that? So I know what was said. Okay. So, and if something goes on for a long time, you can refer back to it. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. All right. So, and out there, that's part of talking to witnesses or potential witnesses. Okay. Also, uh, it's your job, too, to identify potential physical evidence in a case. Yes, it is. And in fact, on the 24th, did you do that? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, did you have anyone assisting you in doing that aspect of it? Yes, crime scene investigators and digital forensics investigator. All right. And was uh, Ms. Melissa Rotten Garden? Uh, is that how to pronounce, pronounce it for me? Rough Garden. Rough Garden. Okay, thank you. Uh, did she help you in that area? She was the lead uh, crime scene investigator, yes. Okay. So were you all walking around together? Give, give the jury an idea of how that process takes place, please. Um, so, yes, when I initially arrive on scene, um, I introduced myself to Sarah Boone and explained that I wished to go inside her residence. Um, she gave me consent to go in and look around. Um, I went in, looked around, um, and then when my CSIs arrived, um, they, they would go in, take pictures, um, and then I kind of leave them to do what they need to do as far as taking pictures and documenting things and measurements. And then that's when I conducted my interviews. And then I would meet back up with my crime scene investigator after interviews were conducted um, to kind of follow up with like things that I was told that would help us like identify things from the scene. Um, and so, I mean, there's like multiple occasions where I would have met with my crime scene investigator inside the residence. So this is an ongoing process you in that day. You get information, you consult with them, they have their problems, they consult with you. And you make another determination of what potential physical evidence that you have. It's like a document by camera, correct? <laughs> or actually collect and take a Is that correct? Yes, it's accurate. Uh, uh, in that case, uh, the suitcase was uh, some evidence that y'all agreed on that we need to take the suitcase from the scene. Is that correct? Yes, it was. How about the baseball bat? Was that done that day? The baseball bat was collected, yes. Uh, um, in your viewing of the suitcase, did you see the view the suitcase while it was unseen? Yes, I did. Uh, did you notice that, that there was any items, other independent loose items in the suitcase? There were, yes. Were those items collected? Some of them were, yes. Who made the determination what items of that suitcase would be taken or collected and what would not be collected? I would say that I have the final say on what is to be collected or not collected, um, but we do discuss it together um, to make that determination for me to give the final yes or no. Uh, do you recall which items you decided to collect from the suitcase? Do you have the property form that I can refer to? 
No, I'm trying to find. I know some of them, but. <laughs> Ma'am, I don't have but to the best of your memory, can you tell? And I would I would understand it would be some stuff that if you have to report to refresh, but you can give me more detail. Um, yes, to my understanding, um, and to my recollection, uh, we collected things that had blood left over on it. Um, I want to say there was like a necktie potentially. Um, I do recall there being um, a small amount of clothing and miscellaneous paperwork, but I do not think that we collected the paperwork. There was also a cell phone in there. Um, it was not, um, it was dead, um, the cell phone. And then, like I said, there might be one, I, I think we collected five to six items from the suitcase itself, um, but obviously the, the property form would tell you specifically. But that is what I recall. Correct, and I understand, and that's fair. Okay. Um, so, potentially, you, you collect these items because you believe they're evidence for the case, potentially. Is that correct? Yes. And some of these items you actually collect with the potential that you might need to have them examined in greater detail. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, an example of something like that is would be in this case if you found blood or something you might want to potentially examine that. Is that correct? Yeah. Uh, and also the stuff that you're learning other outside of these items also helps you in making that determination. Isn't that correct? I'm sorry. The stuff that you you learn, the information that you're getting or you're receiving about what happened at that time will lead you to determine what items might need to be collected and what items might need to be tested. Correct. Is that correct? Yes. All right. Um, so, out of the items that were collected, uh, at the house or the apartment, at those items, was anything, to your knowledge, sent off for further examination? I believe so, but if it was, there would be, um, uh, they would be sent to the Florida Department of Law Enforcement for further testing. And do you have an independent memory of what items that were collected from the house that was sent to FDLE for further examination. I don't recall specifically without looking. Okay. <laughs> now, are you aware that at one point in time there were some fingernail clippings or fingernail swabs uh, taken from Miss Sarah, is that correct? Yes. In fact, that was done on her interview day on the, would have been the 25th? Yes. Is that correct? Yes. Okay, and that's what we witnessed in the video. Yes. At that time, correct. And I'm sure at the autopsy, which you were present at, is that correct? Yes. And those, uh, there would have been some fingertip swabs of George Torres. Or were you familiar with that? They do swabbing of the hands, to my understanding, and um, things of his nails. Okay. Uh, do you uh, have an independent memory of the fact that Sarah Boone's uh, fingernail swab was sent to FDLE to convict? I would believe so. Okay. How about the one from Mr. Torres? Do you have knowledge that those were sent to FDLE for conviction for identification? Well, they would have come from him, so I'm not sure what we would have compared him to. Okay. Uh, were they there to see, or at least they're sent there to see if they can extract uh, DNA? 
Oh, okay. Yes. I mean, I'm not sure if they did that testing for his nails clipping specifically, but it would be in the uh, report itself. Okay. Who would make the decision about sending his his uh, swabs to FDLA for comparison or evaluation? Uh, I would request it from, or I would request it to the crime scene investigator, and she would um, like author the procedure for them to do so. Okay. And um, then as to Sarah Boone's swabs, uh, who requested that those be sent to FDR A4 evaluation? And I would assume that I would have done that. Um, I would have requested the CSI to do that. <laughs> Are you aware of the results from those evaluations? Just, I'm not asking you for the results, just if you're aware of the results. I believe I'm aware, um, but would love to see a report for, before I specifically answer. Yes, I'm not going to ask you specifically. Oh. Okay. Um, but basically, you're aware that it was done, the procedure was done. Yes. Now, ma'am, uh, so you're through the first day. Uh, then we get to the second day, which would have been, I believe, uh, the 25th of February. Is that correct? Yes. And on the 25th of February, it was Mr. Torres's autopsy done at that time. Yes, it was. Were you present during the autopsy? Yes, I was. And did you communicate with the medical examiner at that time? Yes, I did. Uh, during, the, during the course of things, uh, is that where you uh, found out through the medical examination? Examiner at the autopsy that there was um, blood or trauma. Injuries. Yes, that is where I learned about more about his injuries. Now, initially, when you were on the when you were on the scene on the twenty fourth, uh, did you view Mr. Torres's body? Yes, I did. Did you notice? In and of yourself, on y'all, something that caused you concern that there might be blunt force trauma. Injuries. Yes, I noticed injuries. Okay, so after uh, the autopsy, you had additional information. Is that correct? Yes. Now there was an interview, well, I don't know if it was an interview, there was a meeting set up for uh, Sarah Boone, is that correct? Yes. On the 25th? Is yes. that correct? Yes. Can you tell me how that meeting was arranged or how that meeting was set up? Please? So either before I left the scene, um, the night of the incident, I obviously met with Sarah and told her that we were leaving. Um we had to go make Mexican notification and um, I would have either at that time said I would like to meet tomorrow um, and arranged it then um, at least to like let her know that I would like to meet after the autopsy and then um, obviously from watching the video towards the end she said um, something about like recalling a conversation that we had like calling me um, so there may have been a phone conversation that occurred later that evening, um, where I either would have confirmed the time or told her the time then. I just don't have that like on an audio. Um, but I know it either took place before I left the scene because I obviously would have, you know, said my goodbyes and told her, Hey, we're leaving. We're going to make next kid notification. She was very concerned about that. So I would want her to know, um, that we were doing that. Um, so it either took place then or it took place on that phone conversation that we had. Okay. All right. The day, the day prior to that, on the 24th, ma'am, uh, you see Sarah Boone's phone. Is that correct? Yes, her phone was on this. 
And uh, when you received that phone, Sarah Boone had given you that phone. Is that correct? No, she was not allowed in the apartment to give me the phone. I'm sorry. Did she give you permission to take the phone? Yes. Okay. Is that correct? Yes, I was given permission to go through her phone, yes. Because at that time, you hadn't applied for any type of search warrant to get or search the phone. Is that correct? No, I, it was based off of consent. Okay. So she had consented to you to, uh, for you to have her phone. Yes. She also provided you the code to get in the phone. Is that correct? Yes. So at this point in time, Ms. Boone is cooperating with you, isn't that correct? Yes. Now, ma'am, we recall telling her, Ms. Boone, that she could that she could get her phone back the next day. I don't recall specifically telling her when she would be able to get her phone back, but I did say something along the lines of um, we were now going to be taking the phone. I obviously had digital come out. Um, for consent to go through her phone. There was evidence on her phone that I needed to be downloaded. Um, and at the time, I was willing to give back her phone um, before going through it. And then once we had gone through it um, and those videos were found, I felt like this was very different. And it um, changed my perspective on consent. Um, and I decided at that time that it was best to get a search warrant. Um, so consent couldn't be basically like I knew I was going to take her phone. Um, so consent has to be basically given to me throughout the entire period. So she would have had no way to contact me to tell me she no longer consented. So therefore, um, because there was evidence on the phone, um, I took the phone. Basically, I potentially told her, you know, maybe we didn't get a full download. I may have said something along the lines of that. Um, as far as me taking the phone, um, and then uh, I wrote a search warrant. Um, I either started writing the search warrant the night of, but it wasn't signed until I didn't submit it until the next day. Um, and then it was signed the next day on the 25th. So basically, what you're telling us is that she could have withdrawn her consent at any time prior to that search warrant being received. Is that correct? Well, while I was on scene, but at the end of the day, there was evidence on the phone, so I knew I could go through the. I knew I could get a search warrant to go through the phone based off there being evidence, um, like the nine one one calls, um, and her explaining to me that they had spoken to family members. Um, Please silence your cell phones. Since they had explained to me that they uh, spoke with. Um, family members the night prior. So I wanted to obviously corroborate her statement. Um, so I knew that I would be able to get into the phone through a search warrant. Um, but yes, yeah, she could have not consented and she could have not signed the paper consenting while we were on scene. Okay. But before you left scene, uh, you knew that Sarah Brown was not going to get that phone back. Is that correct? Yes. So when Sarah Boone called you the next day, uh, asking you about bringing her phone back, um, did you just tell her, Ms. Boone, you're not getting the phone back? There was not a conversation about her not getting her phone back. She may have inquired about her phone, um, and I would have explained that. We will talk about it when we meet in that afternoon. Okay. So, did you reach out to Ms. Bone that next day, or did Ms. Bone reach out to you? I don't recall a specific if she reached out to me the night of the 24th or before the interview on the 25th. I don't have my call records um, for that. Um, I'm just basing it off of the interview where she had basically said that, yeah, I have your business card and I can contact you like I did. Um, so my assumption would be that we did have some sort of conversation either the night of the 24th or before the interview on the 25th. On the, uh, on the, on the 24th, you make arrangements with Sarah Boone to meet with her on the 25th. 
So I either made arrangements on the 24th with her before leaving the scene, and I would have told her I would like to meet with you the next day, or I said, um, and I may have given her a specific time at that moment, or when we spoke later that evening um, on the phone, I may have confirmed the time or given her a time then. But she definitely knew that we were meeting at 3 p.m. on the 25th at Orange County Sheriff's Office Central Operations. And then you don't, you, you just don't remember at what point in time you informed her to set up this meeting with her. Is that correct? It's one or the other. Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, as it to it being one of the other, you did the, uh, you prepared the investigative report in this case, is that correct? Yes. Uh, and, and the investigative report, you basically summarized everything that took place in this case. Up to a certain point. Yes, it was a certain Yes. All right. As far as evidence, as far as witnesses who were talked to and synopsis of what they said to you at that time, is that correct? Yes, things that I did specifically. It's a summary of that. I found your investigative report to be in great detail because it helped me track this case from basically the beginning to not to the end, but to the point where the report was stopped. Stop. And it seems like in your investigative report, you are very thorough about details. Is that correct? I would be a detailed person, yes, thank you. Okay. So being the detailed person you are, look, and absolutely, through your law enforcement training, they tell you, they train you that your report should be very much in detail. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Because my type will refer back to them at a later time. Is that one of the reasons? Is that correct? Yes, and to prepare myself for depositions and trials. Okay, and just to give an accurate picture of what you did and uh, what took place and what people told you. Is that correct? Okay. Being as thorough as you are with these contacts with people, I didn't see in the investigative report when the arrangement was made with Sarah Boone to meet you down, and what, I'm sorry, where did y'all meet? The Orange County Sheriff's Office Central Operations. Uh, to meet you at the Orange County Sheriff's Office. I did not see that in the report. Do you have an explanation why? It's not typically something I would put in my report. Okay. Do you remember in, in uh, having the conversation with um, Ms. Boone about this meeting that was supposed to take place uh, that uh, you said that you could not return the phone to her uh, that day because uh, you, were, you were not feeling very good. Do you remember telling her that? That never happened. Ma'am, get some get some phone. Ma'am, doing this time frame here. Were you pregnant at this time? At that time? Yes. Okay. All right. Well, anyway, uh, Miss Boone, there was a, a meeting arranged. Is that correct? For the 20th at uh, 3 p.m. Yes, and Miss Boone showed up for that meeting. She did. Yes. We saw. Okay. Now, ma'am, I'd like to talk to you about some other investigation. On witnesses, other witnesses that you uh, took at that money or state recording state. 
use a different one. Okay. Uh, do you remember uh, Abraham or no? Yes. Okay. Did you take his three-quarter statement? Yes. All uh, right. At the time that you took Mr. Moreno's three-quarter statement, was there anyone else with you? My partner should have been with Detective Scott Owen. Excuse me? My partner should have been with me, Detective Scott Owen. Okay. Ma'am, as to who was with you, would it help uh, refresh your memory if you were to see your investigative report? Your Honor, I don't know if Jack said that she needs any aid in refreshing the memory protection system. Ma'am, was Detective Scott Lowney with you doing that interview? Yes, I believe so. May we approach? Yes. Ma'am, do you have an independent memory of Detective Scott going in with you at that interview? I believe my partner was with me on the interview. Yes, I typically wouldn't go and do some follow up without my partner being with me. Thank you very much. Now, ma'am, did that interview, what date did that interview take place on? I believe the 26th, February 26th of 2020. Okay, thank you. Uh, Ma'am, was that interview recorded? It was audio recorded. Was the entire interview audio recorded? Yes, the entire interview was audio recorded. Ma'am, are you familiar with a witness by the name of Brandon Motes? Yes, I am. On February the 27th of 2020, did you take uh, interview Brandon Mose. I believe so. It's either the 26th or 27th. If you were to see your investigative report, would that help refresh your memory? All right. We begin from Jack. She needs assistance with her now. Okay. Objection sustained. <laughs> Now, if it was a 27, you would not disagree with that, would you? Well, I just stated that I was at the 26 to 27. Okay, thank you.
Mr. Mouse, uh, he was the uh, neighbor living in the apartment, or the connecting apartment, wall apartment, with uh, Ms. Boone and Mr. Torres. Is that correct? Yes. He's the one who told you about the animals. Is that correct? Yes. Did you interview anyone else in the Reference to that file from us. So I was interviewing Brandon, and then my partner was interviewing Vincent, the other witness, and I came in at the end of the uh, interview with Detective Wallen. Okay, so that's Vincent. Do you know his last name? I would butcher it. Uh, me too, but spectacular. <laughs> Something like that. We're talking about the same person? Yes. Okay. And did that interview take place on February the 27th of uh, two, uh, 2020? I believe so. I interviewed witnesses after I interviewed Sarah. The 26th or 27th would be my memory. Okay, thank you. And then... Um, did he also talk to you about a lot of I believe that I was refreshed on the conversation, um, and yes, he ex- he expressed hearing a loud noise as well. Okay, thank you. Now, and those those interviews were actually audio recorded too. Is that correct? Yes, they were. Now let's go to. Miss Boone's interview. And that would have took place on the 25th. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. And Miss Boone came down. Uh, and, ma'am, prior to Miss Boone coming down for the interview, had y'all made the decision that Ms. Boom was going to be arrested? Yes, I plan to arrest Sarah Boom. Okay. Did you tell Ms. Boom in arranging the meeting that when she came down there, she was going to be arrested. Your Honor, I'm going to object this to relevance. Check is over rule. So at that time, 
You did not tell Miss Boone prior to coming down there that she was going to be arrested. Is that correct? No, I did not. Okay. Why did you not tell Miss Boone that she was going to be arrested? We planned to meet at 3 p.m. and go over the autopsy and have another interview. Um, so, I mean, I'm not sure why I would tell her that she's going to be arrested. That would potentially cause her to flee. Um, you know, not come, and then we have to go find her and make it more difficult for everyone. Well, potentially get an attorney to come work for She has read her rights that said that she has a right to an attorney, um, and if one cannot be provided for her, uh, she will be appointed one. I understand that. You read her those rights when she got there. Is that correct? Yes, I did. You didn't read those, her, those, those rights to her before she got there, though, did she? I wasn't in contact with her. Physical contact with her. Okay. So, you said potentially for clean. My question was potentially she could have had an attorney too to come with her. Is that not correct? I misunderstood your question. I didn't hear potentially bring an attorney with her, but yes, I guess she potentially brought an attorney with her. So, Ms. Boone shows up. And uh, you you tell her that some things that we need to talk about. Is that correct? Specific verbiage. I know I said something along the lines of uh, obviously the autopsy had been conducted, um, and there were things that we needed to like talk about in regards to that. And prior, okay, but prior to discussing it with her and asking her questions, you did. Is that correct? Prior to, I'm sorry, one more time. Before you started asking her questions, though, in this interview, before you started asking Ms. Boone's questions, you read her, her Miranda warnings. Is that correct? Yes, before I started asking any sort of incriminating, potentially incriminating questions, she's read her Miranda warnings. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Ma'am, do you remember that part of the Miranda warning that you read to Miss Boone? Did you read her the one that states that if you decide to answer questions uh, but want to stop answering and consult with an attorney, you may do so. Do you independently remember reading Miss Boone that instruction? <laughs> Don't recall uh, that specific, but I do have my Miranda card on me, but I don't recall that that's what that says. But it is on audio and video recording. Okay, thank you. Now, ma'am, at that point in time, uh, Ms. Boone wasn't under arrest. Is that correct? Ms. Ben was not going to be free to leave once she was in my custody. At that point in time, had you told Ms. Boone that she was not free to leave? No, I did not. At that point in time, had you told Ms. Boone that she was under arrest? I told her at the end of the interview. Okay. Before the interview? No, I did not tell her before the interview. Uh, ma'am, why didn't you tell it before the interview? You are not going to get to ask and answer total. So I have to read her her Miranda warnings, and that's what I did. I do not have to tell her that she's under arrest at that time. Was there a reason? Could you have told her that she was under arrest before me reading her her Miranda warnings? Your Honor, I'm going to object. This is all speculation. It's the same. Ma'am, was it a strategic decision not to tell Miss Boone that she was under arrest prior to reading her those Miranda warnings? Your Honor, I'm going to object. This is relevance. Thank you.
the objection is sustained. Ma'am, and we were able to see the video of the beginning as a process of interviewing people. So, well, let me specifically. In the process of interviewing Ms. Boone, uh, is law enforcement free to give information that might not be accurate or true? Doing the editing process. Are you asking for a left lie to her? Yes. Yes, to an extent. Was that done at any time? Did I lie to her? I don't recall lying to her. No. Yes. Thank you. State redirect examination. No, you're not. And this witness be released. State. Um, we have her subject to recall. Okay. I have your release subject to recall. Thank you. Great, thank you. State any other witnesses, evidence, or testimony to be produced. Try this time to stay rest. Okay. Members of the jury, it is 10.22 a.m. I have some matters with counsel that I need to address. So we're going to excuse you for a short while. It's a great opportunity for us to take our morning break as well. Similar instruction that I've given to you over the last couple of days. Please do not discuss this case amongst yourselves or anyone else. And do not conduct any independent research or investigation as the person, places, things, or charge involved in this case. We'll bring you back as promptly as possible. Thank you. Jerry, actually. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Defense? Any motions? We do have some motions, but my client needs to go. Okay. We can do that. It may be fairly lengthy. Agreed. Uh, let's go ahead and take that break. We're going to be in recess for 10 minutes, and then we'll pick up um, any motion practice at that point in time, or it's going to be off the record. Thank you.
Now we're back on the record, 2020 CF 2603, State of Florida versus Sarah Boone. Appearances for the state. Yes, sure. I'm happy to state. William Jay for the state. Defense. James Owen, Ms. Boone. Tony Henderson. Tony Henderson from Sarah Boone. Yeah, fair. I'm happy to say it. Do we have any motions? You may proceed. Yes. Yes. Yeah, this topic has to do with our judgment of will. Uh, let me start with just a real quick couple of comments, Your Honor. We know that JOA motions have come become essentially pro forma, uh, which may be why I've been assigned this responsibility today. But uh, in this instance, I want to make an argument that I think has some merit. Um, I've been paying close attention. Uh, to the testimony in this case. Uh, and I want to point a couple things out. First of all, we know that the court has essentially become, has assumed the role and has assigned the role of becoming a gatekeeper uh, in this matter. We know from the testimony that's been presented in this matter that not only did law enforcement, but also the Office of the State Attorney had knowledge of these parties uh, prior to the event having occurred. Uh, and despite that, uh, the state has proceeded with this prosecution based on criminal information as opposed to having taken it to the grand jury. Uh, that kind of places the court in a special position to evaluate the nature of the, the evidence that's been presented. The, I want to focus on the second degree murder uh, allegation. And one thing that occurred to me while watching the evidence as it was presented, watching the videos, particularly of the interrogation, was part of the dialogue between Ms. Boone as well as Detective Scott Lowe on the end of the um, interrogation. And I'm paraphrasing, I apologize, I should have written this down verbatim, I did not. But she's advised that she is being placed under arrest. And her response is, Why are you doing this? The detective's response to Ms. Boone is because George is dead. I'm sorry. Because George is dead. That's not enough. It's not enough to support a second degree murder, prosecution, conviction, or should, or should it even be enough to allow this matter to go to the jury. Now, there are three elements of the second degree murder. Information first that the victim is dead, that Mr. Torres is dead. We stipulated to his identity uh, that there's been no argument to the fact or the idea that uh, he died in this incident. However, the state also has to show that it was caused by a criminal act and that the act was imminently dangerous and demonstrated the depraved mind. Now, the fact that it was imminently dangerous, I think, is belied by the fact that. Jorge Torres voluntarily entered the suitcase, uh, albeit under the influence of alcohol. Uh, the perception of dangerousness, dangerousness that's attributable to the victim, apparently he did not perceive it to be a dangerous or imminently dangerous uh, situation in having entered the suitcase, uh, possibly because of the influence of alcohol on his capacity to make decisions, uh, should necessarily be attributed to the defendant as well. But I also want to focus on the depravity issue, which the state must prove. Uh, and pursuant to the jury instruction in this matter, depravity is equivalent or equivocated or equivocated, is made of the equivalent of ill will, hatred, spite, or, or evil intent. And that's not enough. Not only does the state have to show depravity, but it has to show, because it's in the conjunctive, uh, that the act demonstrates an indifference to human life. The state has presented testimony and argument in this matter, not argument, but uh, testimony that, that George Torres was suffering. Suffering does not equal hatred. It does not equal ill will. And even if they were to establish negligence, that's not coincidental. Uh, we know that Suffering is something that courts have been very, very cognizant of 
and very sensitive to. Uh, we know it from the field of capital punishment uh, and incarceration. Pun the idea that somebody suffers is not in and of itself homicidal, nor should it support the idea that there was indifference to the life of George Flores by Sarah Boone. Was she angry? I think there's clear evidence that she was angry. But that's not hatred. And that's the element that has to be proven here. And I don't think that there is a prima facie case that in fact she was, that she demonstrated hatred so much as she demonstrated anger. Does the established prima facie case uh, of second degree murder? It's for those reasons, Your Honor, that I think that this matter should be uh, the motion for a JOA as to second degree murder should be granted. Uh, and this matter should be allowed to proceed solely on a manslaughter charge uh, because, in fact, they have not established prima facie elements at the court of our law. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. Response? Yes, thank you. Standard at this time is just a prima facie case. Whether uh, any trier of fact in taking all the facts uh, in the light most favorable to the state and inferences drawn from them establish the elements of the crime. There are three elements to this crime. George Torres is dead has been established by a prima facie case. The death was caused by the criminal act of Sarah Boone that has been established. There was an unlawful killing of George Torres by an act imminently dangerous to another and demonstrating a depraved mind without regard for human life. An act is imminently dangerous to another and demonstrating a depraved mind if it is an act or series of acts that a person of ordinary judgment would know is reasonably certain to kill or do serious bodily injury to another. It's not just Boone's subjective statements on February 25th. I had no idea you could die from being zipped into a suitcase for uh, 13, 15 minutes before she goes to bed. Two, is done from ill will, hatred, spite, or an evil intent. We heard what she said. Uh, the two minute video starting at 11, 12 p.m., 45 seconds would be linked in Merriam Webster's digital dictionary for the definition of depraved mind. Fuck you. I don't care. Laughing. Is of such a nature that the act itself indicates an indifference to human life. Sarah, that's my name, don't wear it out. Judge, um, there's there's no question that a prima facie case has been laid in addition to the two minute video and then the twenty the two second video eleven minutes later. We also have the defendant's inconsistent statements uh, that she has made in regards to these events. And therefore, we have that factual issue for the jury to decide. She uh, made statements on the 911 call and to law enforcement, both on the 24th and 25th, that I have no idea what happened. Um, I just went to sleep. Everything was good. And then when confronted with her video um, on the 25th, uh, we, we see that there are two distinctly different sets of statements that were made. Um, so this is uh, sufficient at this stage in time for a jury question. Thank you. Thank you. Any other additional argument, Mr. Beck? No. Oh, thank you. Thank you both for your arguments. Uh, the court, in viewing the light most favorable to the state, the court finds that the state has presented competent but rebuttal evidence to establish each of the elements of the charge contained in the information to the required level of the prima facie showing. As such, the defense's motion for a judgment of acquittal is denied. Um, Defense, do you intend on putting on a case? Yes. Ms. Boone, I have a couple of questions to go over with you. Yes, sir. In a normal criminal trial, uh, my position has always been to put on the defendant last call the witnesses, put on the press, and then part of the last person to testify. Because of the nature of this charge and our defense, self defense, and that spouse, uh, we understand that we have to put on her, their her support to they consider whether or not we established um, that evidence for self defense instruction. So she's going to have to be one first as a witness. Um, I'm going to need a few moments with her based on 
everything that's going on based on that denial, that motion for judgment of the court. To just go through it again, because I know you've been asked to talk about that. So uh, I'm going to take a few moments to go down on For the three lawyers, four lawyers, maybe we're going to have the people here or maybe back there. I'll um, just uh, a short video. I'll give you that opportunity, but before you do that, ma'am, I don't, again, don't want to go into any specifics of any conversations that you've had with any of your attorneys in this case. Mr. Owens has identified for the court his normal practice, calling a defendant last in a criminal case. In this case, he has advised that he wants to call you first. Without going into any discussions of any strategy that you've had with your attorneys, do you understand the strategy that Mr. Owens and your team will be utilizing in your defense? Yes. And are you in agreement with that strategy? Yes. All right. Counsel, you can have that opportunity to speak to her. The court will remain here. I don't know if they can correct. Uh, Officer Jones, can we let them back to have that conversation? Okay. All right. You can go back and have that conversation. The court will remain here. We'll be in a short recess for approximately 10 minutes. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you. 
We're back on the record. Case number 2020 CF 2603, State of Florida versus Sarah Boone. State, appearances for the record. David Hester on behalf of the state. William J. State. Defense. Jane Gullies for the state. Tony Henderson for Sarah Boone. Kevin Cutt for the Capitol. Ms. Boone is seated at council's table wearing the same black laser and dark blue blouse uh, from this morning. She is in custody, however, not wearing any restraints. She'll be able to stand when our jury enters, and if she is called to testify in this matter, she will be able to walk to the witness stand. Um, Ms. Boone, I have a couple of questions to go over with you. Similarly to our conversations earlier today, I don't want to know about any of the substance of any conversations you've had with your attorneys, just whether or not you've had certain conversations. So far, you've been present throughout the entire trial process. You've been seated at counsel's table. You've had the opportunity to observe the evidence presented by the state, as well as the direct and cross-examination of the state's witnesses. Are you satisfied with your attorney up until this point? Yes. Now, I'm similar, I'm going to ask you some questions, again, about specific conferences and conversations you have with your attorneys. I don't want to know those specifics, just whether or not those things have been had. Have you had the opportunity to discuss with your attorneys whether or not you would like to testify as a witness in this case? Yes. Do you any, need any additional time to discuss that matter with your attorneys? No. Have your attorneys discussed with you the potential benefits and potential harms of testifying as a witness in this case? Yes. Are you satisfied with the advice from your counsels? Yes. Do you understand that attorneys can make most of the decisions about trial strategy? They cannot determine whether or not a defendant testifies or not. Do you understand that? Yes. Not even the court can interfere with the defendant's right to make that decision. Do you understand that? Yes. Do you understand that it is your decision and your decision alone? Yes. Well, counsel can give you advice on whether or not it would be wise for you to testify in this case. Do you understand that you can ignore counsel's advice because the final decision is yours? Yes. Do you understand that you have the right to remain silent? Yes. Did you hear me explain to the jury at the beginning of the trial how the right to remain silent is absolute and the fact that a defendant did not testify cannot be considered as evidence of guilt or influence their verdict in any way? Yes. Before a jury begins its deliberations, the court will read another jury instruction if you decide not to testify. This instruction orders the jury not to consider your silence as evidence of guilt or to consider your decision at all. Would you like me to read that instruction for you at this time? Yes. This instruction 3.9a, entitled Defendant Not Testifying. The Constitution requires the state to prove its accusations against the defendant. It is not necessary for the defendant to disprove anything, nor is the defendant required to prove her innocence. It is up to the state to prove the defendant's guilt by evidence. The defendant exercised a fundamental right by choosing not to be a witness in this case. You must not view this as an admission of guilt or be influenced in any way by her decision. No juror should ever be concerned that a defendant did or did not take the witness stand to give testimony in the case. Do you have any questions about this instruction? No, Your Honor. And do you understand that if you choose to testify, you are waiving your right to remain silent? Yes. That means once you begin to answer questions, you have to answer all questions unless I instruct you not to answer a question. Do you understand that? Yes. You cannot pick and choose which questions you want to answer and not answer. Do you understand that? Do you understand that if you refuse to answer any questions, the court can impose sanctions, such as holding you in contempt, striking your entire testimony, and instructing the jury not to consider any of your testimony? Do you understand that? Yes. If you choose to testify, you will also be subject to cross-examination and impeachment. That means the state could ask you about any prior felony convictions or convictions for crimes of dishonesty if you have any such convictions. If you have any such convictions, the questions will be limited to whether you have such convictions and the number of same. Do you understand that? Yes. Are you aware if you have any such convictions? Yes. State? 
Are you aware of any felony convictions or convictions for crimes of dishonesty? No, I think she's answering in front. She's aware that she doesn't. Okay, so you have no such convictions. Okay, thank you for that clarification. Now, as there are no convictions, and that number is not in dispute, the state will not be permitted to inquire into those matters. Have you had enough time to discuss your decision to testify or not testify with your attorneys? Yes. Again, do you need any additional time? No. Has anyone forced you, threatened you, to get you to testify or not testify in this case? No. Has anyone made any promises to you to get you to testify or not testify in this case? No. Are you satisfied with your counsel's advice so far in this case? Yes. Are you making this decision freely and voluntarily? I Did anyone force you, threaten you, or coerce you to testify in this case? No. Would you like to testify or not testify as a witness in this case? Yes. Okay. And ma'am, similarly, after you've had the opportunity to converse with your lawyers again, I want to confirm that you're on board with the strategy that they've utilized in your defense in this case. Yes, I understand. Including calling you first. Yes. Okay. All right. I want to remind you, ma'am, that you can change your mind. You just have to let your lawyers know before the jury comes back in. Do you understand? Yes. State, anything else we need to address? Just the law of the case is that there should be testimony from uh, the defendant on an overt act that particular day before there is testimony about verification evidence, fire, violence, or any other ancillary things that come in. So, the whole case speaks for itself. Anything further? The rule of law of death as it relates to co crime, to remain silent, or just to talk. I have no good about it. Okay. Then what do we need to address with regard to Holland? Well, I've got three issues. One is Holland. The other is I've got these gloves. My client and I would like to take a few moments to look at the suitcase and to look at the bag. And then the third thing is uh, that the state can file that motion for the in camera hearing. I don't know. Maybe we need to hear that before she testifies. The court's not going to address that at this time. We'll address that later in the proceedings. So, two things. Number one, um, of course, I've got a lot of photographs about prior violence that George Torres committed on Sarah Boone, and there's a dispute about whether or not I have to establish an overt act that she responded to, that she considered an imminent threat, and that she took evidence or she took action to the block or physically restrain George Torres from committing an act of violence on her. But, Judge, if you'll remember, during the two-hour interrogation, the officers make mention that they are aware of the prior incidences of violence. So I, I believe the door has been opened, but I can go into that based on that those statements by the two detectives. Uh, if, you, if you remember, she, they introduced this two-hour video. She says, he comes at me all the time. I think eventually uh, Sarah Boone realized that they had her phone, and they were going to see pictures, they were going to see videotapes of evidence that George Torres committed acts of violence on Sarah Boone. I think at that point she changed her tone about what she was trying to protect George, but then she realized she would have to disclose uh, some of the acts that had been committed on her by George Torres. And so she did talk about him coming at me, and, and we've had issues before, and the officers Gave, I can't remember exactly what they said, but yeah, we're well aware of, I, I don't know if they said the prior acts, or we're aware of the domestic violence, whatever the case may be. I submit that open door. That was during their case in chief. They chose to play that entire video. And so I think I can talk about the prior bad acts uh, before we have been in question chronologically. And I've got, of course, I've got a bunch of photographs that uh, go into physical evidence of her injuries as a result of George's George's violence. Okay. Response, if any. Judge, we're asking for the court to maintain this ruling. Um, we are correct with instruction because these are allowed to tell her things to try and make reactions from her. She affirmed that she denied the number that that night to the police um, and to the court for the ruling in pre-trial. So, I've been trying to get some guidance on this. Review this both most recent statements on the matter, and there is no overt act thus testified to. So we are 
hopeful that we will maintain that rule in the round, that will have a prejudice in her or her team in any way to establish an overt act on February 23rd, 2020, before we go into recognition of its prior instances of violence in the matter's house. Any other further argument, Mr. Owens? I don't find that the officer's statements are character evidence, and you're looking for specific instances of conduct, which are going to be utilized for those specific purposes for reputation or uh, violence to establish the fear component that, that the case law speaks a lot about. Florida Supreme Court decision in Holland is clear that that overt act needs to be established before any of that evidence is submitted. I don't find that it's an opening of the door, and I'm going to rely on what the Florida Supreme Court has told us to do. Judge, uh, I've got I've got to get the clerk to mark some photographs, and then my client and I need to um, take that suitcase out of the box and inspect it, play with the zipper a little bit, and then also take that uh, bat out of that paper bag and inspect it uh, before she testifies. Thank you. I'm just confused why we haven't utilized the nearly half an hour or more that the court was on the bench to get these photographs marked. Um, the defense team has been on the board for quite some time. They did not request a second evidence view of the physical evidence, but who had an opportunity to do well with the pro se. It's 1125. We need to, we need to try the case. Judge, so, I think that she. She had that evidence view, I think, with Billy Lane. I believe that was the day after I filed my notice of appearance, or maybe it was the day I filed my notice of appearance. I don't remember exactly, but it had already been previously scheduled. I was in Milton, uh, so they went ahead and did it that morning, at, I believe, at the jail. I believe the evidence. Any particular reason why it hasn't been done in the last 45 minutes? Because I'm, when I sent my juror out, my jury out. I've been meeting with my client about her rights to testify or not, and uh, other related matters. So, um, in terms of not giving her this evidence? In terms of anything that the state just discussed? I've just been busy with, with my clock. Okay. How much time do you need in order to pre-mark these exhibits and look at the baseball bat and suitcase, which have been entered into evidence? I would say about 15 minutes. I'm very concerned. Because it is eleven point. Early lunch. It's eleven thirty. Let's take an early lunch. We've got witnesses coming this afternoon anyway. Uh, if if her testimony ends before five, um, we've got one or two witnesses that are here, and then I believe tomorrow is Wednesday. We've got Dr. Brandon. It's going to be here first thing Wednesday morning, and then I believe Dr. Harper is not going to be here till Thursday morning. Uh, so I don't. We're going to have a little gap in time unless we can. We've got to put on several officers about prior acts and all that. But uh, I think the purposes of this, Judge, in the abundance of caution, I feel like I need to go over this this evidence with my client uh, before she testifies, and uh, I have not had a chance to do that. Other than seeing it here today, but, uh, I think I need to do that with her before she just can the parties approach for a moment.
It is 11.35. Councils have matters that they need to address with Madam Clerk for the pre-marking of exhibits along with the review of the suitcase and bat which were previously entered into evidence. I'm going to bring our, based on the agreement of the parties, I'm going to bring our jury panel in at this time, release them for lunch, give them similar instruction to the instructions they've been provided earlier, and we will commence promptly at 1 o'clock this afternoon. State, any disagreement with the battle plan so far? Same question, Mr. Robbins. All right, let's go ahead and stand right up. Bring it back into our panel. Seated. Members of the jury, again, once you're seated and comfortable, if you could raise your hands to confirm that you can with the court's instructions. All right, thank you very much. Thank you for your patience. Matters with counsel took a little bit longer than we anticipated. We're going to take an earlier break today. It's 11.35. Uh, we anticipate the defense putting on a case this afternoon, and we don't want to get into it and then have to break a half an hour into it. So we're going to go ahead and take that break at this time. I'm going to give you a similar instruction as I've read to you over the last couple of days. Jurors, you must not conduct any investigation on your own. This includes reading newspapers, watching television, or using a computer, cell phone, the internet, any electronic device, or any other means at all to get information related to this case or the people and places involved in this case. This applies whether you were in the courthouse, at home, or anywhere else. You must not visit places mentioned in the trial or use the internet to look at maps or pictures to see any place discussed during the trial. Jurors, do not watch local news or read local newspapers. Jurors must not have any discussions of any sort with friends, family members, or even your fellow jurors about the case or the people and places involved. So do not let anyone make comments to you or ask questions about the trial. I want to stress again that just as you must not talk about this case face-to-face, -face, you must not talk about this case by using an electronic device. You must not use phones, computers, or other electronic devices to communicate. Do not send or accept any messages related to this case or your jury service. Do not discuss this case or ask for advice by any means at all, including posting information on an internet website, chat room, or blog. With that, members of the jury, I thank you for your time and your service and your attentiveness, and we'll see you at 1 o'clock this afternoon. Thank you. Jury, thank you. Thank you. State of defense, if you could please review those items and please mark every defense exhibit at this time with Madam Clerk, and I will see you all to commence promptly at 1 p.m. Courts and recess. Thank you.
We're back on the record. Case number 2020, CF2603, State of Florida versus Sarah Hoon. Let me get appearances from the state. Dave Castro, on behalf of the state. Queen Jacob, the state. Defense. County Henderson, Ms. Boone is seated at council's table, wearing the same black jacket and blue blouse from this morning. Um, we will be standing when our jury enters. She is in custody, but out of any restraints. As she is testifying first, once we bring in our jury, she will walk to the jury box, be sworn in in front of the jury. State, we're ready to bring in our panel. Yes, Your Honor. Uh, I will be able to get the redactions done. I put a disc on Mr. Owens' notebook there. Has the case number on it, three black dots and Sharpie. Just a, a random way of saying what it is. Excellent. Appreciate it. Thank you for getting that done. Uh, over the lunch hour. Defense, are we ready to bring, some, bring in our jury? Yes. Number one, Kevin Beck is uh, working along here. For the record reflected, Mr. Beck has appeared. <clears throat> For the record, I'd like to make two points about uh, this issue about whether or not I can bring in evidence of prior acts, prior bad acts, prior to the overt act. And there's two reasons that I believe I should be allowed to do so. One is, Judge, in that two-minute video, Sarah Boone makes a statement, that's how I feel when you choke me. And then some. Some moments later, that's how I feel when you cheat on me. And she's angry at him, and she's talking to him. She's talking to him in an intoxicated state, and she's expressing her anger and why she is angry. And I ought to be able to elaborate on what that is that she's angry about as it relates to when you choke him. That's my first. Okay. The second one is judge on this. We proceed with the second. The second intertwined with the first. So, I mean, it's it's a similar argument, but it's related to something else. Okay. Response. Judge, I don't disagree with you to bring that in once they establish the overt act that is a uh, dangerous from an objective reasonable person. That's the law. Any further arguments, sir? Not on that issue. Motion's denied. The court again is going to rely on the Supreme Court's guidance in these situations based on Holland 916 7 second 750 at one point 760 through 761. My second argument ties into what you just said about what a reasonable person would do under the circumstances facing an imminent threat, whether a reasonable person would perceive the, the overt act on the part of George Torres. That was witnessed by Sarah Boone, would that be perceived by someone as a imminent threat? And to some degree, you have to understand the history of George Torres and Sarah Boone. They worked together for three and a half years, they weren't engaged, but there had been a history of violence. And from the evidence that's been presented, Facing the, the circumstances of total, if you take what she said at various times, you would understand that she became concerned when he came back from Publix with that second bottle of wine because she knew when George Torres gets to a certain level of intoxication, he gets sad, he gets moody. And eventually he gets belligerent, and sometimes he can be violent. So she knew when he brought home that second bottle of wine that it was not going to be a good night. And she tried to keep him occupied and tried to keep his mind off of his troubles because she knew that if he reaches a certain level and is dwelling on his hardships, that he will react to her in a violent way. So she had that state of mind with that understanding of her history and his history in his overt act, which she's going to testify to, coupled with the fact of her state of mind based on her past experiences with him in that intoxicated state and the fact that he was violent. So she was hypersensitive 
too dangerous and fear. And I think that ought to be allowed in as part of her collectively an overt act. So it was culminated by his state of occupation, coupled with his overt act, created the well founded fear for her to block the attack, to self restrain or physically restrain George Torres in the suitcase to actually use the bat to prevent him from getting out of the suitcase because she knew she was going to get attacked. And the, the basis of the opinion of, about the attack is predicated on the prior incidences of violence, correct? Based on well, there's an all that activated by George Torres that she was hiking because she knows that he gets to that level of intoxication and that's a scenario and that's an issue. So I need, I need clarification. What is it that you're asking me to do? For me to be able to elicit from Sarah Boone that she was concerned once that second problem was brought and that that's why she tried to predicate him over the course of the evening and that's why she had a heightened sense of heightened sense that he it was capable just to do that to do his degree of intoxication that he may act violently towards her. The problem is, part of the problem is, Judge, he doesn't remember battering her the next day. That's part of the reason that she videotapes him and photographs him. She starts to document what happens so that she can show him. She loves the man. She adores the man. She wants to marry him. She wants a life with him. But She's trying to get a on, and so that all ties into her behavior, uh, her sense of nervousness uh, at that point. The reason she was so confident during that two minute period video was because she knew, okay, this is my chance. He can't get to me. I can tell him exactly what he does that bothers me, that hurts me, and how I. And so that's all tied together with, the yeah, he struck, he starts to try to get out of the suitcase, and she reacts the way she does. Respond. Thank you. We held these arguments uh, already for the rule. There are no new arguments being made. The court understands exactly what Sarah Boone, the defendant, said to Dr. Werner on October 2nd. The court knows exactly what the defendant said to Dr. Harper over the period of the number of months and years, and there was no overt act. Um, the overt act has to be something that is objectively reasonable cause a reasonable person to believe there's an imminent fear of great bodily harm and death. But the testimony is, is not um, that that's what has occurred. That there's her new testimony is this generalized fear, but you've already read that. You've already ruled on that. And I'll just remind the court that her previous testimony is it's all fun and games. We're laughing. I zipped the suitcase shut. They're still both laughing. It's funny. And then the decedent says, I can't breathe. And then she flips a switch, gets angry because it reminds her of all the times before where she is asserting that the decedent made her feel like she couldn't breathe. And then that's when she starts beating and shuffling the suitcase so much that it flips over and hitting him in the back. Well, we've covered this ground. Aggravated assault, aggravated batteries, independent forceful felonies, she's committing false imprisonment. She is the initial aggressor after there being no overt act. She can't start it and then say, well, I'm in fear of retaliation because that's what her testimony was is once I started doing these things, once I wouldn't let him out of the suitcase, I was afraid he would come out and harm me or kill me. Well, Judge, if I pull a gun on you and I say, give me everything you own on you right now, and then you in turn pull a gun on me and say, bam, 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 and shoot and kill me, and I shoot, uh, let's strike that, you pull a gun on me to defend yourself, and then I shoot and kill you. I can't assert self-defense. I can't say, well, Judge Cranick pulled a gun on me and I was in fear of death because I had, I was the initial aggressor. I was committing a force of felony. That's the facts of these, this case here, according to her previous testimony. And the state concedes if she wants to change her testimony again, that's one thing. Then we'll cross that bridge and get there. 
But if she testifies that she previously has, the court has already ruled there's no overt act. And you've read the transcripts. You know what she has said. She hasn't said She hasn't testified. Dr. Hawkins testified. Dr. Walker testified. They have not testified. They've given depositions. They've given depositions. But she hasn't testified about the act in question. She hasn't testified about the incident in question. She had consultations of the evaluations by Dr. Hawkins where they had discussions. And Dr. Hawkins could delay in her testimony. Dr. Walker can say what was said during the evaluation. Again, both of those were not appealed. There, there may be disputes. I disagree with the characterization of that assessment. But it's up to Sarah to tell the truth here that she's on the road. She's on the road today. She's got an obligation to tell the truth. If he thinks she's made prior inconsistent statements, it's up to him to impeach her with those inconsistent statements. To the extent that you are requesting permission to go into presumably and seemingly prior bad acts vis-a-vis, he got the wine, and I know what happens when he gets it, and everything that follows from that. Those are bad acts. That is character. And the Florida Supreme Court has provided guidance and circumstances, specifically in Holland, on what needs to be done. You are attempting to provide information that the defendant was apprehensive of the victim at the time of the homicide, by virtue of wine, etc., as you prompt. That's bad character evidence that you're going to be bringing in. Historic bad character evidence. This is what happens when he drinks. This is what happens when I don't placate him. This is the situation that I find myself in, which inevitably may dovetail into prior incidents of abuse. That's all prohibited character under 404, 9404. And the carve out for that is if a overt act is established. It's not a subjective standard. It's an objective standard. The jury instruction 3.6F identifies it being an objective standard. And the Akendo case specifically tells us that it's an objective standard. And Akendo, the second DCA in 2023, stated the conduct of a person acting in self-defense is measured by an objective standard. But the standard must be applied to the facts and circumstances as they appeared at the time of the altercation to the one acting in self-defense. I'm going to rely on Holland. Holland is the law of the land. It is what the Supreme Court has told us to utilize. That's what I will be relying on. The overt act has to be established. Ms. Boone, do you understand that? I do. Okay. Anything else? We did not talk about any prior bad acts or anything of that nature until we talk about the actual event we had. Correct? Do you understand? Do you understand that? Okay. Anything else, Steve? Defense, anything else, sir? All right, let's go ahead and stand and bring in our jury. seated. Members of the jury, after seated and comfortable, if you could raise your hands to confirm that you comply with the court's instructions during the break. A record reflect all hands have been raised. With that, state has rested. The defense is going to put on a case. Defense, Mr. Owens, you can call your first witness. The defense would call Sarah Boone. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
Right now, you can take a seat, and if you could, state and spell your name for the record. Sarah Ben, 101077. And could you spell your name? S R A H B O O N E. Thank you very much. Sir, you may inquire. Ms. Boone, would you please uh, tell the jury where you were born and raised? Atlanta. You were born in Atlanta? Right, I'm right. And how long did you stay in Atlanta before you moved here to Florida? I was three years old, three or four. Okay. And um, from that time, y'all moved, you and your family, your mother and father, moved to Orlando? And my grandparents. Okay. Y'all all moved down from Atlanta down to Orlando? Yes, my two brothers. Okay. And uh, did you were you raised here essentially from that time on? Yes. And you resided here in Orange County, Florida, the entire time. Yes. Okay. And uh, what did, did you go to high school here locally? I did. Where did you go to high school? Edgewater. Okay. And tell the jury uh, how old were you when you graduated? I was eighteen years old. Now I know you lost your mother and father. Um, I know you lost your mother and father in your teens and in your twenties. Is that true? lost my grandfather when I was a sophomore in high school, and I lost my father when I was a senior. And then uh, my mother passed away a few years after that, and then my grandmother passed away after my mother died. But you were in your 20s when all that was going on? Yes. Okay. And then at some point in your 20s, you met uh, Brian Boone? I did, yes. All right. And did uh, how long did y'all take before you were a good handful of years, my I helped my family with paying mortgage and bills for the house since my father had passed away and my grandfather. So, um, so you worked outside the home. I did. Okay. Can you tell the jury when you said you and Brian Boone um, dated for a while? Do you remember uh, when y'all married? I did. Can you tell the jury when y'all were married? The year. Yeah. Um. Do you remember the date? It happened to be, yes, that after my mother passed away, that he had waited to ask me to marry him because he knew it would be. Um, I, uh, Sustain. Just just answer the question if you can, Ms. Are you Are you a little bit nervous? A little bit. Okay. Well, just, just tell the jury, do you remember the date that you and Brian Boone married? August 21st, 2004. Okay. And had y'all lived with each other for a, little, a short time before that? Time. Yes. Okay, after you married, how long was it before y'all had any children? Um, gosh. Six years. Okay. And y'all y'all have one son. Yes. What's his name? Lucas. And how old is Lucas now? Lucas will be fourteen years old on the twenty eighth. Twenty eighth of this month? Okay. So you and Brian um were married and y'all lived in Orange County. How long were y'all married? Thirteen years. Correct. And y'all divorced? Yes. And as part of the divorce, were y'all share custody of your son? Yes. Okay, so y'all split days. Would that be fair to say? Yes. Okay. It's sometime after you and Brian split up, did you meet uh, George Torres? Yes. Or did you tell the jury how you met George Torres? Um, I met George when... I decided to buck up, I guess, and I was tired of trying to patch things up with my ex-husband, and I decided to go one day for a walk across the street and go have a beer by myself and sit and people watch just to get out of my house and a change of scenery. Oh, now, this is, is this your apartment? No, this is the marital home. Okay. Where is that marital home? One of her. You're no longer living in that marital home? No. Who lives in the marital home? Um, no one. It has been sold. Okay. So this, you met George Torres before you got the apartment? Yes. Okay. And you met him at a bar across the street from the marital home? Yes, we have a mutual friend there. Were you introduced? Yes. All right. How did you and George um, get along with your person? Um, very well. It was, um, 
it's strange how quickly we hit things off and had so much in common. And um, I never thought that he would be interested in someone like me. And I just couldn't believe that he was actually interested in me and said a lot of nice things. And um, one hour ended up being four hours um, from when we had first met. And then we would always have something to talk about. Why, why couldn't you believe that he would be interested in you? Um, he was very handsome. Um, he was very funny. Um, he was smart, and I would show up in workout clothes and disheveled hair. And I guess I kind of felt broken from being in the process of the divorce that he knew about. But then one of the things that we could relate also was the fact that he was here in Florida because he had just been divorced of the second wife. So that was another. Um, topic that he and I could compare notes on. So eventually, the divorce was settled. Did you get your own place? Yes. Is it fair to say that after you, at first you lived in your parents' home, correct? Yes, until I was married. And then you lived directly in with Ron. Yes. And y'all lived in the marital home, correct? Yes. And then you got this apartment. Yes. So that was the first time in your life that you actually had your old place. Yes. And what was the address? 4748 France Court, apartment number three. And what city is that in? It's in Water Park. How far is that? 20 minutes. Okay. So you got that apartment, and uh, initially, were you by yourself? Um, or tell, tell the jury. Um, in the almost year, about 10 months of separation from Brian, my ex-husband, that is the time when I met uh, George, and my ex-husband was trying to buy me out or force me out of our marital home, and I had to find somewhere to live. And um, So did you, did you and George agree to rent the apartment? Yes. One of the, the I did extra income, could not afford it, um, just on my own. You were receiving some income from the, the marriage settlement, were you not? Yes. So you, you did have a consistent monthly income coming in from the uh, settlement, marriage settlement? For the most part, yes. But you needed you needed more to, to uh, live? Yes, pay the bills and for rent. So did you and George have some agreement? Yes. Or what was the agreement? The agreement was that if I decided uh, for he and I to live with one another, because it would be under my name that he would help with the monthly bills and on a regular basis where it would be something that I would have to argue with him about. It would just be an automatic uh, make sure that everything's paid first and then from there hopefully have some fun with it. Okay. So I understand from that point on um, it would be fair to say that y'all saw each other on and off for about the next three and a half years? No. Um, we were, I I consider us a couple. Okay. At some point, he asked me to marry him. Okay. But y'all y'all did have times when he left and went to live with his parents. Yes. Is that, is that fair? Yes. And there were times where uh, there was an understanding that y'all were going to break up? Multiple times. Okay. All right. So, again, on again, off again. Yes, this was actually before we had our um, uh, apartment. That was, I guess, our dating days. So, so y'all were together for three and a half years. Is that fair? Mm -hmm. Yes. And y'all had actually agreed to marry? He had asked me, yes, um, a couple of times to marry him, and one time I agreed to, yes. Okay. Now, I want to get directly to the date of this event so that the jury can hear your testimony. All right. So, tell us, I believe the date is February the 23rd of 2020. Explain to the jury that whole day, the time y'all got up, the whole thing.
objections are ruled for now. Now it's been, let's just, instead of one long speech, let me break you up over the course of the day. So, do you remember the day of February 23rd, 2020? Yes. Do you remember getting up? Yes. All right, just tell the jury about that morning. What y'all did that morning. What you and George told You and George spent the night together at, at the apartment. Yes, at that point he was living there. Yep. So y'all slept in the bed together upstairs. To, so you got you had gotten up, y'all had gotten up that morning, February twenty third of twenty twenty. Yes. All right, tell the jury what happened when y'all got up. Um, he was already downstairs and I went downstairs and he wanted to start the day off by drinking because it was a day off from his job and I Talked him into cleaning and tidying up the house for a sense of accomplishment. Um, so that is what we did um, for however long that it took. Um, so we did tidy up the house and got everything in order, and it was kind of a reward, I guess, to sit and enjoy ourselves and um, sit on the back porch. All right, what do you mean by cleaning up the house? What did you do? Um, we swept and mopped. We folded some of the laundry. Um, I know that we did the dishes. Um, emptied the dishwasher. Just general run of no tidy. And okay, did you have your son coming the next day? Yes, that was one of the reasons why we we were able to do that. What was the arrangement you had in terms of the next day and your day to pick up your son from school? Yes. What time would you pick Lucas up from school the next day? I believe his school ended at 3 o'clock. Okay. So you would have been responsible to pick him up and he would be spending the night with you that night? Yes. So you want to have the house nice and clean? Yes. How many bedrooms are in the hall? Two. And uh, you and George had one bedroom? Yes. And who had the other? Lucas. Right. Is that exclusively his bedroom? Yes. All right. So how long would it have taken y'all that morning to clean? <laughs> I don't really remember what time we woke up, um, but maybe a good two, maybe three hours. Okay. And would it be fair to say that you and George both smoke cigarettes? Yes. And would it be fair to say that you and George both drink alcohol? Yes. So at some point, y'all finished your chores, right? And then y'all going to enjoy the day? Yes. Right. What was the plan? Um... It was just kind of, you know, we've got the day to ourselves. Let's just kind of relax and go with the flow. Uh, would y'all, would y'all make a decision that y'all are going to start drinking? Um, yes, he, we had a uh, half of a bottle that was already in the refrigerator, and I did not want to go out afterwards. I, again, had Lucas coming the next day, so we went over to Publix to purchase another bottle of wine, um, so we could um, not have to go out later on that evening. Now, you were here in court when the state, the state played the video of you two in the public's purchasing the bottle of wine? Yes. Is that what you're referring to here with the jury right now? Yes. Okay. And that was around noonish. I believe so, yes. Okay. Had y'all started drinking the, the leftover bottle or before, before going to the public? No. Okay. So... Y'all bought a bottle of wine? Yes. All right. And how did y'all get to Publix? My car. How far is Publix from your apartment? Five minutes. How would you get there from your apartment? Um, did you have to go across any major highways, or is it right there? Um, You just come out of our um, apartment complex, and you do a little youth turn, and then you come off, and it's right in that complex. Okay. But it's easier to drive than to walk. Yes. Now, I know that sometimes y'all would, y'all would simply need cigarettes and it was mm-hmm. walking. Can so you tell the jury about that? Yes. Um, there was a Lotto Zone convenience store with um, in the same, I guess, parking lot of our townhome, our complex. Mm-hmm. And it was just a straight shot from our um, apartment to a back gate. And you could get right into the convenience store from right there. Okay. But y'all went over to get that bottle of wine around noonish, and how did y'all, y'all, you took your car? Yes. Did George have a vehicle? He did not. Okay. And uh, how did you pay for the car? 
with my debit card. And then y'all came back and started drinking? Yes. Okay, tell us what you did when you got back from the boat. Um, just went on the back porch where we um, usually spend our time because we're able to smoke cigarettes outside as opposed to inside. And Is cigarette smoking not allowed indoors? It's not. Okay. Do you have pets? Yes, I do. Oh, did, you, did you have pets? I did, yes. Okay. Um, were they with y'all there that day? Yes, my dogs were with me all the time that I was there. How many dogs do you have? I have two. And uh, just what are their names? Penny and Tess. And what, what is the breed? Um, they are red Boston Terriers. And are they both the same? Um, yes, Penny is blind and Tess is deaf. So when y'all went out to smoke on the back porch and drink, I assume, as well, correct? Yes. Um, do y'all take the dogs out? Oh, yes. Um, is there a place for them to do their business out there? Um, yes, I extended our back porch um, for them to have a little bit of area as opposed to going from a large back yard from my marital home to our little town home. And um, they would come out there and do their business, and I could sometimes open, I would open the gate and walk them in the back part of our um, apartment. So you enjoyed, you just going to enjoy the day together? Correct. Is it fair to say y'all have a lot of money? Yeah. And so y'all are going to do something there in the home. Y'all are going out for dinner. Yes. We primarily, I would consider us homebodies as opposed to going out and partying and doing that. Okay. And how long do you think y'all are out uh, that afternoon outside? <clears throat> um, a few hours. Uh, could you tell the jury what y'all did? That um, we have a dartboard that's out there, and we just had drinks and we're uh, just really enjoying each other's company and talking about you know things coming. You know, uh, we both were looking for a job and just kind of, I guess, encouraging and supporting and planning. So now you said he had a job. Was he looking for a job? A second job? No, the job that he had was very unstable, and at that... So he was looking for something new? Yes, at that time, yes. Okay. And so, during that two or three hours, would it be fair to say that y'all drank the bar? Yes. Okay. So, would it be fair to say that y'all are feeling the effects of the alcohol? Yes. Okay. At some point, who made the decision to come in? I... Okay. Why, why, did, y'all, why did you want to come in? I felt that Doris needed a change of scenery. Okay, so y'all came in, and then, um, did y'all do anything else before he left again? Were y'all doing anything? I know y'all, y'all did some arts and crafts. What, what did y'all do? At some point, he went to get another bottle of puppies. Yes, um, after... I believe it was after we had, it was right before I believe that we had gone inside. Um, uh, he called his daughters. I was trying to encourage him to call his family. Okay, now where, where are his daughters? Uh, his two daughters are located in Pennsylvania. And what are their names? Anna and Destiny. And how old are they? I think Anna is in her 30s and um, Destiny may be in her early 20s. Uh, does he have any more children? Yes, he has a son. And what is his son? He is in Pennsylvania also. Okay. So, part of that afternoon is y'all came in to call relatives, call family? No, I had him call outside um, just trying to I guess boost the mood um, and uh, First daughter didn't answer, and I don't remember the reason I didn't speak to the second one. It, I believe he did. It was just for a moment. All right, whose phone y'all using? My phone. Oh. And is that common for y'all to use that phone? For y'all share that phone? It was because George said that he didn't have a phone, so um, it would either be lost or um, 
yeah. given to him by his mother. So I didn't know he had a cell phone, so he would use my phone. So it was primarily your phone? Yes. Okay. And um, you took a lot of photographs that were on that phone? Yes. Video tapes? Yes. Text messages? Yes. Phone call? Yes, he and I both on phone calls. So he would use it as well? Yes. And uh, that phone, is that the one that was, that was seized in this case? Yes. Yeah. All right, so y'all called his daughters, and then um, during that phone call period, did y'all also call his brother? Yeah. Okay, and who, which brother was that? John. How many, how many brothers and sisters does George have? Um... I'm going to listen to the second okay. thing. Okay. Um, it's John, Burrell, Isaac, Mo, and his sister. Okay. And do they all live here in Florida? Yes. Are they close by? Right now, yes. What about his parents? Yes. Do they live here as well? Yes. Okay. But his ex wives and his children live up in Philadelphia. Philadelphia? Yes. Okay. So you called call the girls, then you called the, or George called his brother? Yes. Was that conversation that long? No, it's not. Okay. And then after that phone call, uh, what did you, y'all, were y'all inside by this time? Yes, at this, at this point, I believe that it was a good time to get a change of scenery. So I, thought George would be better off inside, and frankly, I didn't want to be outside any longer either. So just to get an idea, about this time when he went to get the second bottle, or did y'all stay inside for a while before he left? No, um, from what I recall, it was, I thought the day was over, and it was going to be, uh, get ready for eating today, what, maybe what do you want for dinner, you know, do you have an extra load of laundry that you need to throw in? Kind of thing, and that was my understanding. And this, said, this was about five ish or something. I don't remember the time. Okay. At some point during that time period, did George go to Publix again? Yes, I thought he was going to be walking to the convenience store, but apparently, um, when he returned, he had gone across the street with my car and my debit card to buy another bottle of wine. What was your understanding of where he was going? To the convenience store, walking for what? Cigarettes. And you learned, you learned obviously that he came back, and you you learned that he'd used your vehicle. Yes. And he'd used your debit card. Yes. And he brought back a bottle of wine from Publix. Right. And you saw the uh, the Publix video of that. Yes. So he comes back with the other bottle of wine, and did he want you to drink with him? It was expected. Yeah. And you, you agreed to consume the one the second bottle with you? Yeah. So over the course of that evening drinking the wine, did, what did y'all do for time wise? Uh watch a movie, music, just kind of tell the jury what you remember. I know it's obviously been a while, but uh, it's kind of a regular thing where um I would always try to come up with um, entertaining activities for George. And um, for, uh, I bought a, a puzzle. Um, we started off uh, at one point doing a smaller puzzle, and then we did that very quickly. So then I purchased a larger puzzle, and I believe it was a thousand pieces. So I thought to get his mind off of things and to focus on something, uh, it would be smart for us to do the puzzle. So for however long that took, um, we finished the puzzle, so that was one. Did you, did you, every piece was finished, or was? Um, every piece was finished. It was strange that we couldn't find one piece, and we thought it was funny that um, it was like in the perfect place on there. But yes, every every one but one piece. All right. After the puzzle, what did what did y'all do? Um, I decided to continue to maintain and focus. Him and I have a bunch of paints that I used of my son's that um, his grandmother bought him. It's a very big art wooden box and it's got 
pastels, pencils, paint, any kind of whatever. And um, he and I were very much into art. And with these, with this resource, it got me very interested in being more creative. How long have you been in the world? Um, ever since I can remember. As a child. You like to draw? I like to do anything artistic. And I know, you know, we saw some of the pictures of your apartment, but it looks like there was pictures and art with up. Is that all of your work and George's work? The majority of it, yes, are uh, belongings from my home. Uh, and also some of George's, yes, on the wall. Was he pretty good at art as well? Yes. Oh, so you both enjoyed doing that? Very much. So y'all got out uh, Lucas's art set. What did y'all do with that? Um, we were just, I guess, doodling, you know, whatever. I would always tell him that everything that you make is a masterpiece. So um, just let loose and just let it go. And we would just paint and, you know, paint and drink, yes, and uh, listen to music sometimes. Yes. Okay. Now with the dogs, you don't get the dogs anymore. My dogs follow me. Yes. Was there some dancing going on at all? Yes. After we had completed the puzzle and um, I guess we're painted out, um, I thought that it might be a good point for us to maybe listen to some music. Uh, and the music that George listens to is a little, it's very fractious to me. And it was definitely not going to lighten the mood. So we ended up finding some channel on the radio, and um, he was feeling it, and then we ended up, my one dog um, gets very active and was dancing with us, and we were just um, having a good time listening to music. Okay. And uh, I guess it's getting pretty late in the evening. Yes. Anything else I've missed? So tell us, tell us where y'all ended up before before you started the game of hide and seek. Uh, we were there. I couldn't think of anything else possibly that I had to continue entertainment. But I remember sitting at the end of the couch and him sitting in my son's one of my son's chairs that was in the living room and just kind of did know like what are we going to do now? Like I very much would like to go to sleep. Uh, did y'all did y'all finish off the? Uh that model that he had bought? I don't remember, to be honest with you. Bless you. Would it be fair to say that as the day wore on, the more y'all could sleep? Yes. Uh, and would it be fair to say that as the day wore on, the more you consumed, the more the more effects you felt from the alcohol? Of course, yes. Both, both of them? Yes. Okay. So you would agree, would you not, that at the time y'all were trying to figure out something to do and you put your finger on the couch, that y'all, would it be fair to say that y'all were intoxicated? Yes. Tell the jury what happened. Um, at one point, I guess knew that I couldn't come up with anything else, um, tapped me on my knee and said, you're it. So from there, I ran up the stairs and hid into... Um, our shower, um, just waiting for him to find me so we could hopefully go to sleep soon at some point. And, um, and your shower, is it, uh, is it a tub or just walking? It's a tub, um, but it's in the master bedroom, and you have to go all the way upstairs, you have to go in the bedroom, and then you have to go into the bathroom part, and then there's the shower. So did you lay down in the tub? I, at first, at one point, yes, I was. Okay. So you were hiding? I was trying. Okay. And did you believe that he was going to come try to find you? Yeah. Did you wait? Yes, for quite some time. All right. Then what did you decide to do? That I decided that I need to go to sleep. I'm picking my son up the next day, and we need to start wrapping up the evening. Uh, and I went downstairs to find where he was. And what? <clears throat> I think I think the jury has seen pictures of your would you call it an apartment or it's considered a townhome. A townhome. So you walk down the stairs, right? Mm -hmm. And at the bottom of the stairs is a bookshelf here? Yes, at the very end of the yes. Okay. So you walk down the stairs and 
you turn and look in the living room, did you see what did you see? Um, I don't even think I made it all the way down the stairwell because I was just looking for him as soon as I could um, to hopefully go upstairs as soon as we could. And um, I saw, I looked over and I saw him settling himself in the suitcase. Mark, tell us about the suitcase. How, how long? Is it an older suitcase? Yes. Whose who suitcase was it? This is George's suitcase. All right. And did he use it for traveling back and forth to Philly? Yes. I had uh, recently taken him on a trip to go see his children in Pennsylvania, who he hasn't seen in years. And he took that with us. And uh, because of how dilapidated it was, how broken it was, um, in the end, after that trip, we decided that we would donate it. And... Uh I understand y'all kept y'all kept the suitcase upstairs. Yes. How long did y'all keep it upstairs? Since we had moved in. Oh. Is there a, is there a closet up there you kept it in? Yes, it was in the master closet, um, the master bedroom closet, all the way in the back because of um, the size of it, and there was nowhere to put it, so it's all the way in the back. So when did y'all decide to move it down from upstairs to downstairs? Was it that day or sometime early? No, it was. Um, Maybe a week or so prior. Okay. And so what, y'all were going to donate that to Goodwill? Yes, we were going to do, I guess, a spring cleaning. Um, my Anyone who has children understands that. They grow quickly, and there was a lot of clothes that I needed to um, go through um, of my sons. And then also from George and I moving in and just kind of Putting everything in there, is, you know, at one point where we just need to actually go through it and organize it and get things um, more in order. So is that the reason it was downstairs? <laughs> you're going to go in there and a bunch of things that you're going to put inside. Correct. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> so it's been down there a week. So it was already down there. Yes, George brought it down. Okay. So you said that you got down there, you're looking for, and you see him settling into the suitcase. Yes. What did you do? In my head, I said, oh man, um, we're obviously not going to be going to sleep anytime soon. And um, I walked over and uh, he was trying to get himself flat so I couldn't tell that he was in there. And then... You know, let, let me stop you. The suitcase, is it the suitcase over here in the... Yes. Well, you've seen it. You saw it. Yes. Uh, it's a pretty big suitcase. Yes. How, how big is it? George was my height. Um, and how tall are you? I'm fifteen. Okay. And how much did uh, George weigh? I I thought it was a hundred pounds. Okay. And how much did you weigh? Um, I was ninety eight pounds. All right. Do you agree you you put on some weight? Since I've been incarcerated, yes. Well, at the time, the y'all were y'all were pretty skinny. Yes. So, uh, for the pictures, it looks like y'all are both pretty thin. Yes. Um, all right. So, because of his thinness, uh, is that how? And, and he's he's a small man. Yes. So he was able to get in the suitcase on his own. Yes. Did he willingly get in the suitcase? He was already in there. Okay. When you got to him, did he see you? Yes. All right. Tell us what happened. Uh, I, I mean. I just kind of, I zipped him up. We thought it was funny and um, we're joking about how he was he small enough to fit inside of the suitcase. Right, so what happened there? Um, from there, it was just, um, we were laughing about it and um, it was just strange that he was small enough to fit in there and then um, I kind of moved it around a little bit with him in the suitcase still. It was still like that. He was still in the suitcase. Just, I think he and I were just kind of couldn't believe that he was, he could fit in the suitcase. Did you eventually close the top? Yes, in order for, well, the top was already closed. As he was settling himself in there, it was, that's how I knew he was in there was because the top was kind of Flopping a little bit. Okay. So he had gotten in there to hide and he pulled the top. Yes. On top of it. But you could tell he was in there. Yes. You saw him right away. Yes. All right. So at some point, did you zip him up? Yes. 
And what was he saying or doing when you were zipping him up? I thought it was funny. Um, well, you both laughed. Mm-hmm. Yes. And uh, so you zipped him up. Were y'all still laughing once you zipped him up? Yes. Good. Tell, tell the jury what happened there. Um, from there, I just I moved the suitcase around uh, a couple of times, just kind of with on the wheels and moved it around. And uh, at that point, it was still it was funny. We were joking and laughing about it. Right, now, eventually, would you go sit down on the couch and get your phone? Uh, yes. Um, the, um, well, I the suitcase had, um, for me moving it around, had flopped, was flopped over. So while it was like that, I thought at that point I had a moment to, I guess, take the time to talk to him while I guess he was not able to get out for a moment. So you zipped it. You got, you got it on the top, right? Yeah. It gets in, but at some point you flip it over so he, the zipper is on the bottom. Well, it was just kind of how I was moving it around and it ended up kind of flopping, so. It was upside down. Yes. So after you did that, what did you do? Um, that's when I, I went over and decided to um, videotape to just see the, um, I guess, the, the jest in it for him to understand that right now I feel safe and right now I have the ability to actually speak to you uh, in a manner that normally I would not have the ability to do. And you were intoxicated. Yes. And you agree that you said some things you should not have. Yeah. But you you realized he could not get out and get at you. Is that fair? At that moment, yes. So he goes on for about 10 minutes. Uh, yes. you, you heard it here today, did you not? Yes. You heard, you heard his voice as he was speaking from the suitcase. Yes. That was his voice on the video and audio. Yes. And you heard your voice on the video and audio. Yes. That was your voice. Yes. All those things said by the man were said by George in that two-minute video. All the words said by the female were said by you in that two-minute video. Were you intending on showing him the video the next day? Yes. At the time, or the next day, is it fair to say you don't even remember a video of it? I do not. So, from what you can tell from watching it, did that refresh your memory about that a bit? It did. What did you say?
Mr. Owens, you may proceed. Well, I'm talking about just the two minute video that was recorded. Could you just tell the jury what you were feeling, what your feelings were at the time, and then explain? Just explain that. Did you? You, you mentioned, you talked about it. Yeah. You said he was in that confined space. It's my chance. So is that, do you want to elaborate on that? Sure. I. I want you all to know that I, the majority of the time, am always afraid and always scared. All right, well, I understand. Yeah, I understand. But uh, would it be fair to say that you had some anger? I did. I. Would it be fair to say that you wanted to tell him off to some degree? I just wanted, yes, for him to have a better understanding. Um, which the point of the videos and documents that you hire. And you could tell that he was uncomfortable. I'm guessing. And did, did you want him to feel some uncomfort? I did. You know, at some point, you turned off the video. Yes. And then we saw a second video, which is approximately 11 minutes later, and you've seen that video explained to the jury. It was 22 seconds long. Yes. And I don't think you speak in that video. Do you hear George say Sarah one time? Yes. Is that fair to say? Yes. So between the two-minute video and the 22-second video is an 11-minute period. Would you tell the jury what happened? Continue to, I guess, speak to one another and um, your tone changed, and I knew the tone, and um, we ended up, I guess, arguing back and forth with one another, and it was the things that he was saying. Um, very much frightened me and um, cursing at me and threatening me. And did he want you to let him out of the Um, I'm I'm sure so. Go ahead, tell the group. Um, and it just got it got very heated very quickly, and he continued to push on the suitcase. And um. My fear was that he was going to break out of the suitcase, knowing that it was a broken suitcase. And um, his hands started to come through. His his hands started to come through this way. And so I shook the suitcase. I shook the suitcase, trying to get his hand to go back in, shaking it, and telling him that, please stop doing this. Please, please stop doing this to me. Please stop doing this to me. So his hand, his hand actually got out of the suitcase. Yes. And you went to the suitcase. Yes. And shook it. Yes. Did that force his hand to go back in? No. Uh, so you're shaking it. Were you shaking it to try to get the suitcase? His yes. hand back in? Yes. How long did you shake it? I don't know. But his hand was still out. Yes. Was he trying to get out? Forcefully, yes. Was he angry at you? Yes. Were you in fear? Always. If you would have gotten out of the suitcase, what would you have done? Like he used to tell me, he probably would have made me unrecognizable or I would have uh, lost my life. Did you lose the real horse? Yes. Where was the bat in relation to the super? Um, it was um, against the dining room table, right there. How far was the bat from the super? Three, two feet. Was the sand still out of the super? Yes. And was he getting out of the super? He very much trying, yes. And so, what did you do? For the split second reaction that I had, I 
happened to see that, and I grabbed the baseball bat and was trying to poke his hand to go back in to please don't go, don't break through, please. So I hit his hand. What did you hit? The outside part of his hand. Yes. We've seen the photographs of his left hand. Did you cause the bruising there? I'm guessing yes. Now, you've seen the back. It's a a huge back? Yes, I bought it for my son. Is this back needed? Yes. And you said you poked him with it? Yes, I I kind of pushed um like I held it with the skinny part here and then So so you grip here. Caught it at it, yes. You grab you grab it with both hands here. Yes. And then barrel of that, three part of that is here. Correct. And you thrusted it into the different areas of the suitcase? I started with his hand, and his hand, he was still trying to get out. He was still trying to do that. So I started to push on the suitcase around it, hoping to have his hand retract and go back inside. You made those injuries. I did. We've seen the photographs. Yes. We see the the bruising. Is that from that bat? Yes. Eventually, did his hand go back inside from you doing? Yes. Finally, he had had subsided and retracted his hand. So, in your mind, did you prevent him from attacking? Absolutely. Split second decision. Now, once he retracted his hand, did, do you remember zipping it up some? Or what did you do in relation? Because he, he was upside down, was he not? At that point. Yes. At some point, you flipped him back up. I did. Tell, tell us how that happened. He wasn't cursing, he wasn't threatening, he, his hand was inside. Foremost, there was no more of him trying to break the suitcase. So I felt safe enough to turn it back over. It wasn't. It wasn't happening anymore. You went back to the video and the couch. I did. Yes. And we saw the second video. Yeah. The 22 second, and he's right side up again? Yes. Can you hear him say Sarah? Yes. Had you left enough room for him to get out? Zipper to zipper. Yes, that's how his hand was trying. That, that suitcase has two zippers, doesn't it? And they meet at various places along the line? Correct. Okay. How much room? When you zip it over, how much room was between zipper to zipper? I don't know specifically. I mean, it was enough to where his hand was coming out. After you hit him with the bat, was he not trying to get out anymore? No. <clears throat> Did you believe that he could breathe in there? Yes. Did you ever believe he could die in there? No. No. Were you trying to kill him? Never. Did you want to kill him? I did not. Did you walk upstairs? I did, yes. Why didn't you let him out before you walked upstairs? Were you afraid? Terrified more of the word. As long as he was in the suitcase, he couldn't hold. Did you want him to call me? Yes, I wanted him to stop. 
being angry because I know what it is for him to be angry. You went upstairs. What did the dog? The dogs ran upstairs with me. And what did they go? Uh, from the bed. Did you have to call me? Yes. I know at some point you called your husband Brian, did you not? I did. Do you recall how long that conversation was? Not very long. Can you recall what was it? I don't remember exactly. No, I don't. Mr. Sarah Boone said that uh, when he was in the suitcase, he was threatening her, threatening you. Can you tell the jury what he was saying? I don't know. Am I allowed to curse? Yes. Uh, but he was going to fucking end me. And it, that's what made me ask him please to stop doing what he's doing to me. That he was going to, I'm guessing, try his best that he could probably take my life. But what? The, the threat you heard was he's. He's going to. Say. Say the word. And me. Excuse me? Fucking and me. Can you? Yes. 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 All right, members of the jury, it is 2.14. I have a matter that I have to discuss with counsel at this point in time outside of your presence. So I'm going to ask you to retire from the deliberation room. We'll bring you back in as promptly as possible. Again, similar instruction that I've given you, please do not conduct any independent investigation or research as the person, places, things, or charge involved. And do not have any discussions amongst yourselves or anyone else about those things. We'll bring you back in as promptly as possible. Thank you. There it is. Proceed with any argument at this point in time. So that's pretty close to what we already knew from the deposition testimony. Uh, 
on the doctor's relaying what she said to the doctor. So what we have here is testimony from the defendant. Um, her timeline is she comes downstairs after having gone up to the shower, hiding, laying down, um, after being declared to be it. She comes back downstairs, and before she gets back to the bottom of the stairwell, she can see that um, the victim is in the suitcase trying to get flat uh, because the lid is flopping. And he's not, he's not hidden just yet. Um, and so she comes over and I believe she testified she was moving it around before uh, actually zipping the lid shut, but moving it around. Everybody's laughing. It's all fun and games still. And then she zips it and it's still fun and games and, and everybody's laughing. And then at this point, she testifies that this is now her opportunity to get on her pulpit to express her true feelings about everything. And that's when she sits down on the couch and opens up her phone device and begins recording what later turns out to be IMG uh, underscore 1062 dot movie at 11, 12, 45 for two minutes and three seconds. During this period of time, the decedent is expressing uh, meekly that he can't breathe. Uh, the only time he ever curses at her is... Sarah, I can't fucking breathe, babe, I can't fucking breathe. Um, he is demonstrating under the law that he is in fear uh, of losing his life. Um, she has committed an aggravated assault. She has committed false imprisonment. She was the initial aggressor. There was no overt act to justify these actions that she took against her boyfriend. She then goes on to say that during this period of time between the end of the movie at 11, 14, 48 seconds and before the next one starts at 11, 23, that it's now at this time, while he's still constrained and clearly unable to get out under his own power despite having his hand out, um, she begins beating him with a bat, um, poking his hands, poking the suitcase with a deadly weapon. A bat is used for baseball, but it can also be used to harm another person. And according to the medical examiner's testimony, there was great harm caused to him, deep ecchymosis bruises. Um, she can't start to do this out of fear, like the analogy I gave earlier. If I pull a gun to rob you, Judge, and you pull a gun, I can't shoot you in self-defense. She, she started this. She started this. There was no overt act. Um, and therefore, um, we're asking for you to prevent, under the case law, uh, any prior instances of, of violence, um, any replication evidence, and any battered spouse symptom evidence, um, because that's simply just what the case ended up being. Thank you. Response. Judge, this was a game by two intoxicated people. When people are drunk and intoxicated, they do silly and stupid things. The evidence is uncontroverted that George Torres willingly, by his own choice, elected to hide in the suitcase. By their interaction between the two of them, giggling and laughing at each other, he consented to her zipping up the suitcase. And the playful nature of what was going on during those few minutes prior to the video. When the video is turned on, there's a two minute period where they're talking. He's saying, I need to get out, I can't breathe. She's not taking him seriously. As you've seen from the videos, I thought it was a boy crying wolf. She did not appreciate. The fact that he could be actually having trouble breathing. And this was a chance for him to be heard by her about how she felt about some things involving their relationship. A short time later, the video was turned off, and then that period has been testified to by my client. And that period is uncontributed. That's a second period of time. We've got that time for the video. We've got the 11 minutes. We've got the 22 seconds. 
And there's no video, there's no audio, there's no eyewitness, there's nothing but Sarah Boone's testimony. She's testified here today that they had words, there were threats, he got his hand out of the suitcase. She knew by the threats and him getting his hand out of the suitcase that he was about to get out of the suitcase and he was going to hurt her. A reasonable person under that scenario would believe he, she was about to be harmed. She was an imminent threat of harm. She blocked that attack by grabbing the bat, hitting his hand. When that didn't work, she started poking him with the bat and the suitcase. Eventually, she poked him several times. He put his hand inside the suitcase. She put the bat up, and she realized he was not going to do that any further. She flipped him over right side up. She still had a fear, knowing that if he got out, she would be harmed. He would beat her up. She went upstairs. That is an overt act based on the discussions, coupled with the fact that he threatened her using the word, I'm going to fucking end it for you, or some words to that effect. I don't remember her exact words just before she went upstairs while he was still in the suitcase. If she would have let him out, and this is a crime, now, now this is an event involving an omission. Failure to act, failure to unzip it at that point before she went upstairs. The failure to act, the failure to unzip, which would have let him out, um, which would have created the situation that she believed was imminent bodily harm to herself. And I guess I'd get a, a couple of examples. Um, let's say that a police officer is called to a scene and the only thing he hears is uh, there is a suspect and the suspect may be armed. So, of course, the officer pulls out his revolver. He's walking around, but then eventually he finds the suspect and the suspect reaches for his waist. The officer doesn't see the gun. But the officer sees the movement to the waist. The officer fires and shoots the suspect. The officer is justified because there's an immediate threat of harm. The officer has to react instinctively. There's no time to think. Similar to the actions that Sarah Boone had to take. Another example, you're in a bar with your buddies and you've had something to drink and another group has had something to drink and one of your buddies gets into an argument with one of the buddies on the other party. And one of your friends seeing that it's being escalated and the guy that's arguing with your buddy is aggressive, more aggressive than your buddy is. Your buddy's trying to settle the thing, but this other individual, maybe he's had too much to drink and he's more aggressive. So you go around behind this individual, and before he's able to strike your buddy, you grab him. You lock him up. That's physical restraint to block an attack. Or you grab him by the neck, and you choke him. Physical restraint to block an attack. That's what she was doing with the suitcase. If she let him out of the suitcase, she was going to be harmed. Based on him trying to get out with his hand, based on the threats he made while he had his hand out, and based on the threats he made while he had his hand inside just before she went upstairs. Okay. Thank you. Of course, going to review the case law that it's obtained in its research in this matter. Come back with a oral ruling momentarily. Thank you.
I'll go back on the record, state of Florida versus Sarah Boone, case number 2020 CF 2603. Uh, appearances for state. Did you catch for the half of state? We have changed the state. Defense. Thank you all for this meeting. County Henderson, Sarah Boone. I'll go back on the Sarah Boone. Ms. Boone is currently seated at council statement, wearing the same clothing from this morning. The court has had the opportunity to review the case law, review the arguments provided by both the state and the defense. The court finds that a overt act has been established. The case law is clear that a scintilla of the providing of an overt act is sufficient to provide the self-defense jury instruction. Um, an overt act is not something that's specifically defined. And for the case law, it's something that's from the totality of the circumstances, seemingly under the authorities that the court has reviewed. As such, the court is going to find that under Holland, a overt act has been established and will allow the, dissent, the uh, defense to proceed with evidence of reputation and specific instances of conduct and that spouse evidence, so long as the necessary predicates are established for those items. Any questions or clarifications with regards to the court's order of state? Defense. Are there any objections to those items? It depends on the items. I was shown a lot of different things, including the fractions of the victim and stuff. I just, we need to, I'm happy to take care of some of this stuff in advance. So I'd rather do it now so that it's not up, down, in and out with the, with the jury. So, Go ahead, Mr. Owens. What do we got? Well, I, I had the court go ahead and mark everything. Some of my things have been brought to this interview. It's four pictures involved in this interview. Thank you. 
had done business for you to the back, uh, it's not funny that I have to support you to the back, to the TV, to Sarah's TV. Why understand? Is this O? This is still O, correct? Yeah. My understanding from the state is there's no objection so long as the foundation is established. Yes, sir. Thank you. We also intend to introduce the video. There's a short video on the side of the video, too. We're not that. No objection so long as the foundation is established. Tape, identification, defense identification tape, two photographs of the incident. Which no objection to the foundation is late, etc. No objection to launch appropriate predicates established. Now, this is the next paper, and there's many more photographs, not the pockets, but two for identification, one photograph. I'm going to draw like a small photograph. Now, this is our focus on the subject. Or, you know, this is a slap or something. Mm-hmm. 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 Mm-hmm.
um, same rule. You can use it for demonstrative purposes, but it will not be received into evidence uh, by virtue of it being duplicative. Identification I six T. Any disagreement with that, sir? Same ruling. Five four finds it's duplicative. Uh, you can utilize it for demonstrative purposes. Identification. Hang on. Is that the house? Uh, I think that's Bravo. Is it the defendant on the porch with two dogs? That was pre-marked before trial with Bravo. It was um, as defense M. Relevancy objection is overruled, uh, but I'm not going to allow the enlargement as it's duplicative as the native photo is in evidence. But you can use it for demonstrative purposes. Yeah, and just use this. Uh, use that. Or use that. How, however, you see further, sir. Okay, this is not working today. I can't speak to that. I don't know that anybody today has utilized it. I know, but that's not connected to the overhead. That's separate part from the overhead. Okay. Oh. Judge. Nothing else to There may be some audio footage to refresh memory. Yeah. We've got two deputies out there. Okay. Right. Uh, <clears throat> Any other exhibits with regard to Ms. Moon at this point in time, Ms. Rollins? Nothing. State any reason why we cannot ask Ms. Owen or Mr. Owens to continue his inquiry of Ms. Boone and have her return to the witness stand. All right. Mr. Owens, anything else we need to discuss, sir? Oh. Sure. <laughs> Stand. Once she is seated, we can bring back in our panel. Let's go ahead and stand and bring back in our panel. Seated. Members of the jury, again, you could, once seated, raise your hands to confirm that you complied with the court's instructions during our last break. Record reflect all hands have been raised. Mr. Owens, you may continue with your inquiry, sir. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you. 
That's good. So I think we left off. You had called the your ex husband. Yes. All right. After after you called your ex husband, what happened after that? Okay. Do you remember waking up the next morning? Yes. Did you sleep in? Not intentionally. Okay. But you didn't get up at 8 o'clock, did you? No. Did you wake up closer to noon? I believe so, yes. Did you check the time? No. Now, um, did you hear some phone, the phone ringing? Yes, my phone. And uh, did you answer it right away? No. All right. Do you know how, approximately how, how many times it rang before you answered? Um, I believe the call was uh, about three times. Did you know who was called? Husband. Then why would he be calling? Um, to make sure that um, I was still on schedule to pick up our son. At three that afternoon? Correct. And he goes to school there close by? Yes. All right. When you woke up, you stay in bed for a while? For a little while, yes. All right, tell the jury what happened. I knew it was my ex husband calling um, repeatedly. Um, I didn't need to right away because one of our problems is that he doesn't understand that I'm moving things around the apartment and looking for jobs and so on and so forth. So I inevitably just let it ring and I sat or laid in the bed and I figured that George was downstairs either drinking or um, looking for jobs um, or may have just left. And so eventually I decided to get out of the bed and start moving to go downstairs. I was motivated enough to go downstairs. And um, when I went downstairs, it was very quiet. So I had the understanding, I believe, that he had left. Uh, and Did you check? To see if he was, where would he be looking for a job? Um, usually on the couch. He would have my son's laptop and he and I, which we would share. Do all of them have the son's laptop? Correct. And the TV was not working at this time? The TV was not there. Okay. So he thought he would be at the living room on, on the laptop? Yes. He was not there? No. Where else did you look for him? Um, I looked on the back porch. Um, I went through the front door um, to see if my car was there, thinking maybe he had taken my car. I went to the bathroom, and when I was checking the bathroom, I saw the suitcase, and I remember about the night prior, and I unzipped the suitcase. And Let me stop you there. You said you were in the bathroom when you saw the suitcase or coming out of the bathroom? No, where our bathroom is, I would have to go to the bathroom here. Mm-hmm. And then when I turned around, I noticed the suitcase and I remember. How did you feel when you saw the suitcase? I don't think I've ever experienced anything like that before. Describe it for the jury. I guess it was... I was aghast and I just can't describe the feeling of terror to a certain degree. Sorry, say that again now. It was terror to a certain degree. Um, I just can't describe it in words, the feeling of remembering. And then he was still in there. I immediately unzipped the 
I immediately picked up the suitcase and I was screaming, George, George, George. And I was shaking him. I was shaking him. And I pulled him out and I stretched him out flat. And then I began instantly trying to do CPR and then was trying to look for a pulse or a breath or just anything. And, um, was just screaming his name over and over and over again. And come on, George, come on, George. And I continued CPR, continued CPR, and I continued CPR and um, was gurgling. And what color was he? What color was he? Yep. He was purple. At some point, did you call your your ex husband? Yes, when he started to gurgle, and I knew that my my ex husband is notorious for bringing my son over in very inopportune times when George is possibly drunk or doing things not appropriate for my son to see, and um, I just didn't know what to do. It was just a quick knee jerk reaction. Brian was kind of my go-to person because of my family being deceased, and I don't have anyone else that I can call. Uh, I just wanted to ensure that he did not bring my son over in the process of all of this. So you called him? I called him. Did you ask him what to do? Or did you just tell him to come over? I just told him to come over. Did you tell him that you felt like George was dead? Yes, I did. And how long? You said it's five minutes from house to house? Yes. Did you call him back? Yes, because he was taking so long. I felt like seconds were hours. Yes. I'm still doing CPR at the same time in the process of it. I'm doing CPR I don't know how many times. Did he get there? Yes. Did he walk in? Yes. Did he walk out? Yes. What did he tell you to do? Call 911. What did you do? Called 911. Is that the recording we heard here in this trial? Yes. Did you vote for I to to stay. George was very Passionate. George was a very real person. George was nice to me on the good days. George complimented me. George and I were two bodies with one soul. He and I would always say. I don't believe that I've ever had a connection with anyone like I have with George. Did you have that connection with your son? I did not. Was it even close? No. George has some good friends, huh? Very much. Did George have some bad friends? He did. Did you drink too much? I did. Did George drink too much? Yes. Tell the jury about George's drink. <laughs> If George was able to, he would drink from sun up to sundown. And me having my son and trying to work and maintain the home and just have a life, a normal life as best as I could, but somehow that upset George. And because I had a certain dollar amount for my divorce settlement. At one point, it was from wine we could afford vodka, so a lot of the times he would take my car and my debit card and go buy the large, we call them handles, of vodka, which is the big, big bottle. And sometimes he would finish that all off on his own throughout an entire period um, of, a, of, a de- of a day into an evening. That's honestly where I thought that he was going to be that morning when I came downstairs because he's notorious for just automatically already being outside from drinking all the time. Uh, and... Uh, <laughs> Thank you.
Yes. How did Georgia's drinking adversely affect you? It would debilitate my ability to help him the way that I was always trying to help him because it would be one good day, a day of survival, um, and then it would be another day where I'm having to kill him off of me and call 911. Why would he do that? Tell us, tell us his pattern as it relates to drinking and then okay. Objections overruled for now. You already get the three and a half years? Yes. Is there times when, when he would get to a, a state of intoxication where he would get violent against you? Quite often. Judge, can I push the witness? Yeah. As long as you show it to the state first, please. Could you look at those photographs and see if you recognize those? 
Fear and accurate depiction of the injuries you sustained at the hands of George Carter? On this occurrence, yes. Do you remember this occurred? I don't so often. Do you don't remember a specific specific date? I don't. But you're sure that that's you? Yes. Is that the injuries that you what's the injuries that are living in? I don't remember specifically. This may, these may be the pictures. So, uh, when we used to go up to his brother's house, his one of his brothers and his sustained. Do you know what happened to? Did, did George cross his Yeah. Or did? Were y'all both drinking at that time? I don't remember on this page. Would you like to move this uh, exhibit? Okay. Right. What was pre-marked as P will be received into evidence without objection as defense exhibit two. I'm not sure. Mr. J. Would you be so good? Thank you. Yes, sir. You may do so. Except there, I think there's a wheel on the top that you can use to. Uh, So he slapped my thigh as possibly hard as he possibly could and said that you're not going anywhere. And it was it was a good slap on my thigh. Is that fair of the accurate depiction of the uh the wound that you suffered as a result of guilt short slapping you on the thigh? Yes. Should I like to call it Q in the face? What was pre marked as Q will be received into evidence without objection as defense three. You may. And the jury said, Is this the photograph of this mission? Yes. Let's show you the location, the sense of indication S. See if you recognize that photograph. I do. Is that your hand? Yes. Is that your blood on your hand? 
Yes, it is. Is that you standing in front of your room with your foot dogs? This is in the kitchen at Brian's house. Okay, what happened there? So, George was very drunk, and um, I went to leave, and he's notorious for taking my car keys and putting them around his neck, and my phone in his his crotch area, telling me to come get him. And I really wanted to leave because of how drunk, and I knew the escalation of the anger. I didn't want to be there when it was at its peak. So I tried to take my keys from around him because he kept taunting me to take my keys, come get your keys. And so I attempted to go and get my keys. And so um, he ended up getting a butcher knife. And um, I called, I had an opportunity to call Brian to come and help me, to come pick me up, to come get me. And, of course, he brings my son with him. And so I'm in the parking lot asking Brian to please help me get my car keys away from him. And there's neighbors, and it's a, it's a scene at this point. And George comes to the doorway of my townhome, wielding the butcher knife, saying that, like, that no one's going to take her fucking keys. No one's going to fucking come into this house. And he's waving the butcher knife. And um, I walked up to him, and I I just wanted to leave. And my little son, who was, I believe, seven or eight at the time, is, is screaming, give mommy her keys. Give mommy her keys. Let her leave. Brian was even trying to negotiate with him, saying, please, you know, you know she'll come back. Just, just let her, just let her leave. So I went up to try and take the keys from him, and he was pulling on them, and I ended up pulling harder, and um, he pulled them back again to try to pull me in the house, and I pulled them even harder, and it ripped my finger. And I, at one point, the, I had lost the fingernail, and the tip of my pinky was severely gashed. What was pre marked as defense S will be received into evidence without objection as defense four. drinking uh, went and made myself uh, as quickly as I possibly could a micro microwave bowl of I believe it was broccoli and cheddar soup and I didn't get it out enough time and he came up behind me and he slapped it out of my hand and it was a second degree burn. I went to the hospital for it. Um, so those were not predictions of the injury to the burn to your body? Yes. Okay. It was pre marked as L would be received into evidence without objection as defense five. <laughs> yes, sir. You have to go to the hospital with all the injuries to your body? Yes. Okay. Yes. Is, it, is that a prediction of the birth? Yes. Is that the problem? Not that I know. And your name? Yes. So I show you the part that you did with the location gang. Four photographs. You look at those all four for time. This is a long story, isn't it? 
So, George stabbed me in my leg. I almost bled to death. Alright, well, let's, let's get back and explain what the left is. I thought it would be nice to cook a nice steak dinner. We don't have two nickels to rub together, so I thought it would be special to make a steak dinner and make potato and go above the normal whatever's left over in the refrigerator. And um, so I spent a lot of time doing that, and um, George was drinking the entire time, and on the back porch. You were drinking as well, you know? I was drinking. Um, he was on the back porch while I was in the house and I was cooking. And um, it was one of those where maybe if I start making dinner now, it will be over at a particular time and we can go to bed at a reasonable time. And um, I even put it in the bedroom and had a movie set up for us to watch. Um, so it would just kind of be dinner in bed. And then um, he came upstairs and saw that I had made the steak dinner, and I don't know how to describe how drunk he was, but it definitely was not George. And um, had him come lay on the bed, sit on the bed, and you know, put the um, I I got the dogs out, and um, I presented him with the steak dinner. And um, sat down and uh, was getting ready to start playing the movie. And um, he starts being very rude and cursing the fake and finding fault with it. And then, um, you know, I'm having to encourage him to eat. You know, if you want me to cut it up for you, I will cut it up for you. Did you want some more sour cream for your, pota- your potato? What can I do to make you happy? And um, then he started to pull on me and kept saying that, excuse me, that I just want to fuck you. Fuck you on the steak and fuck you on the on the potatoes. And I took offense to that and I kept trying to encourage him to eat. I started to eat. Say nonsense. I don't know why he was so angry that day. I don't know if it's because I was... I, I got steak. I don't know. I, most of the time, I don't know the reason why. Uh, so, um, I couldn't take it anymore. Obviously, I was not going to be able to eat. So, I started to crawl off of the bed to leave um, just, just the bedroom. And he told me again that I'm not going anywhere. And he stabbed me in my leg. And it crunched. He annoyed that it made. And Blood started to come out of my leg, just like a fountain. So I got off of the bed. He's starting to freak out and um, grabbed me a, a towel. Um, I got a wet towel, and I'm sitting here holding the towel, and um, it's increasingly becoming even more and more saturated, saturated by the minute. It's just minutes. So I'm going my uh, through towels and towels, and I said, George, I think I need to go to the hospital. This is not. This is not stopping to bleed. This is serious. And um, he got on his knees and begged me, please don't call the police. Please don't call the police. Please don't call the police. Um, and inevitably, he went and got my car keys and put them around his neck again and my cell phone. So I was not able to call him, call anyone. And I wasn't able to leave in my car. So... I figured I would just go downstairs and I'm just going to go downstairs. And I had propped my foot up on the glass table that we had and blood is just everywhere. Blood is everywhere. Um, I can't keep up with the amount of blood and I'm starting to feel very weak and really weird. And he comes downstairs and he's still begging me, please don't call 911. Please don't call 911. I, I kept telling him there's something, this is serious. This is, this is something um, because he knew that he would probably get arrested or something bad would happen to him. So I, I couldn't take him anymore. He was just all over me and just, I'm bleeding. I'm, I'm bleeding very badly and he's having me try to console him. And I kept telling him, please, I need to call 911, please. And I said, okay, just let me, just give me a moment. 
and I crawled upstairs to my son's bathroom, which is the furthest bathroom, away from everything. And I remember holding onto the sink. And I looked into the mirror and my lips were blue. And I I knew I needed help. I, I, I needed help. And he came upstairs looking frantic for me and calling my name. And then um, I turned to him and I said, please, I'm, I'm, I'm going to die. I, I've lost a lot of blood. There's something wrong. My lips are blue. Please, please. We don't have to call an ambulance. If you could just take me, just I'll drive whatever I can do, please, to go to the hospital for this. And he said that before anything happens, I had to concoct the story in order for him to not be arrested or be in trouble. And he did inevitably get to the hospital. So I'm sitting there with this blood-soaked towel with blue lips, trying to come up with a story of what I can tell them when I go down there so he's not in trouble and telling him that it's okay. And I came up with the... The story of that we were sword fighting silly after drinking with our steak knives and he accidentally punctured my leg. And from there, originally um, he told me to drive and because of being on alcohol, and I couldn't. So um, he got into the driver's seat and drove me, and the entire time he's barking at me to make sure that I get the story straight. We're sword fighting, okay? We were drunk. You know, you were being silly. Yes. You get treated there. Yes. Um, I, I was bloody, and... Um, Let me show you this over. Is this a fair and accurate picture of the injury to your leg? Yes, I had to go to two different hospitals there. Okay, so you want to uh, let the person know about how this happened? Yes, they brought in sheriffs and everything. Was it consistent with the they brought in sheriffs? Did you have to answer to the law as well? Yes. Did you uh, stick to the story that you had told you? I did. I just wanted to call this so hot to see. Okay. What was pre marked as K will be received into evidence without objection as defendant six. Trying to sleep, and 
Have y'all been drinking? I, I, I tell her. Um, I know that he had been drinking. It's just one of the instances where I would go up there to try to go to sleep. And but y'all drank together for a while, did you not? Sometimes, yeah. So there were times when you wanted to stay up, continue to drink, and you wanted to go to bed? Many times, yes. You were done, he was not. Correct. Was that one of these times? Yes. So tell us what happened. I'm sleeping in the bed, sound asleep, and he comes into the room and grabs me by my hair a lot of the times. And from here, he scratched me from trying to grab me and then grabbed my hair and pulled me off of the bed and then raked my face across the carpet. These are these are carpet burns. To your lips? Yes. What about the tip? It looks like the eyebrow area. That's from where he, from grabbing me, scratched me and got a hold of me. Why was he managing? Because I wasn't downstairs. He wanted you to be drinking with him? All the time. Sorry, I'd like to hear you from the interviews of the station to your boss. Right. Supreme Martin's team will be received into evidence without objections. Defense Exhibit 7. You may speak.911. Um, George and I had gone to a bar across the street for the walking distance, and um, at some point, um, I asked a, a guy, or he asked me somehow or another, it was over a cigarette. And um, he left, and I didn't know where he went, and the bartender said, oh, he, he left, took your car and left. So, um, why would he do that? Well, I found out when I got home, it was because I spoke to a, another man. And um, so I paid the tab and I I walked home. And he's sitting on the back porch with the handle of vodka. And I was walking on eggshells and terrified and kind of treaded lightly when I came in. And he acted all natural and fine. So I didn't know the reason why that he had just gotten up and left my car. So then um, he calls me a whore, and then he calls me a slut, and then he calls me a cunt. And he gets up and pushes me. And he pushed me with both of his hands so hard that we have um, this little area where our washer and dryer is, and there are metal doors that are on it. And he pushed me into the metal door. And then I fell back, and he got his knees on top of me, on my arms here, so I was pinned down, and he started to strangle me and hit my head up against the metal closet over and over and over and over and over it again, and calling me a fucking whore, and you're such a slut, fuck you, and everything. And um, I, my tongue was flopping out of my mouth, and I was, I thought I was going to bite my tongue off, and. Because of the amount of noise I guess my head was making on the metal door, he slid me down and got back on me and then started to strangle me again. And it was on, we have carpet, but it's very slight concrete. And I was able to get my arms out from underneath and grab his throat and get him off of me. So I, get, I got him off of me and I pushed him off. And he came up, he goes, you fucking bitch. And he stomped my face. And the next thing I know, I woke up. I obviously tried to out. Him? 
I, I obviously, I guess, yes. And um, he was passed out on the floor, and I woke up frantic looking for my phone, and I had to call 911. Okay. The police arrived on that incident? Yes, they did. Is this a fair night conviction of the injury you sustained as a result of the kicking over? Stomp. A stomp? Stomp. Was, was All I saw was his heel. This is a yeah, this is an identification here. Okay. What was pre marked as you will be received without objection is defense eight. <laughs> He grabbed me and pushed me, and it was a rock or a really sharp piece of mold um, around him grabbing me and pushing me onto the ground. And I, I guess it just happened to hit my knee just right on whatever it was. Were y'all drinking? Yes. Why, why did he push you? Because I wanted to get off the back porch. So he wanted to stay out there? Yes. He wanted you to be with him? But what's the deal with wanting to be with you all for? <coughs> Security, I guess. I don't know. I don't know. Do you think you best to lose him? And then some, yes. All right. How about the Kennedy and the Sunday location? Okay. What was pre marked as B will be received into evidence without objection. This defense nine. Mm-hmm. So, three, will you treat it from this, or did you self? Um, no, that was just I know, um, the first aid kit that I had for my son, and I just picked it up. What? I said I got the um, first aid kit that I had for my son, and I just cleaned it up and put a bandaid on it. instances where I would try to pull away from him, and I don't know how my arm started to do this, but from him him pulling from this way, how hard he would pull, uh, if we try to struggle to get away from him, it it would be these bloody um, under the skin splotches. So he wouldn't hit you sometimes, he would just grab you and pull you. Yes, when you trying to pull away from him, that's the point of it doing this. From me pulling away from him. Now, this is one of the many times y'all have been intoxicated. Um, I can't say for sure, but that's good. Whenever it would happen, yes, we'll be thinking. Okay. It was pre marked as W will be received into evidence without objections. Defense exhibit 10. 
from me pulling away from him and whatever under the skin it was that it was disturbed from the amount of pressure of him holding and then pulling from me would create those on my arms. Defense exhibit X for identification. Yes. This is a picture of my hair, side of my head. Is that a fair and accurate depiction? Yes. Of the injury you sustained by George Floyd? Yes. Do you remember this event? Yes. Were you drinking? I kind of not drinking. On this event, you did not consume any of that. I mean, I may have earlier. This was another I was in the bed trying to sleep. Um, downstairs she came. Alright, so you you were wanting to go to bed and he wanted you to stay down there with him? Yeah, go to bed. Or tell the jury what happened. What was in the I believe this was the instant where I was in the bed and he I barricaded the door with our dresser. Why like, did you just lock it? Yeah. All of the locks were broken. Yeah. They were from George's room, including my son's. At one point, I could see refuge in my son's room, but he broke out from his phone. Well, so, tell me, explain how that happens. Tell the truth. We can't read your mind. George wants me, what she has told me numerous times, that I am to be with him at all times, and he doesn't like to be. Uh, apart from me or away from me. So whenever it was, even just to go to the bathroom sometimes, I he would go with me. And you have to understand, I have a two-story, 900 square foot townhome, so there's not many places to go. So it just happened to be that it would be upstairs or downstairs or I'd be in a particular room or not. So uh, inevitably, did you want to come away? Yes, I did. Even if it were just him upstairs or me downstairs or vice versa. So I rarely got to sleep. Um, this was one of the instances because I had barricaded the door with our 200 pound dresser that we had. And then uh, I had my nightstand barricaded up against that, up against the bed, where it was even more difficult from the prior times of him breaking in. Uh, and he would, I don't know how he would ever do it, but he would get himself in through the, the crack of the door that he would be able to wedge in, a wedge the dresser and the nightstand. And he pulled me out of the bed and, and told me I was going to die. And um, it's, I believe it and, and punched me and punched you on the side of the head? Yes, was my it, temple and everything. Was it an open fist or a closed fist or you know? It was fully closed. The one that did page next, the was pre Martin's X will be received without objections. Defense Exhibit 11. I know the police came, but I don't remember. I remember it hurt for a good solid two weeks after that. Yes. Now, do you recognize this photograph, which is identification lot? Yes. 
Was that the date of the incident? The date of this event? No, it happened prior. I mean, the picture that was taken of the... This picture was taken, would have been taken on February 24th of 2020? Yes. And do you recognize that as your fake post facial child? Yes. Is that fair and accurate? We should have your face well for February 23rd of 2020? Yes. What's the significance of that? Again, because I was sleeping, um, George was upset with me and came in with a metal curtain rod and bent it and snapped it in half and then crunched me the forehead with it. Um, and it started to beat the furniture that was in the, um, in the bedroom. Um, it, this is probably a good month uh, before or after it had happened before I really do believe that I should have gotten stitches but I was not allowed to go to the hospital. Mm-hmm. Uh, like uh, a notification why in the news of the evidence? It was cash. Okay. What was pre-marked is why we'll be receiving the evidence without objections to defense 12. Is that just in the current law you mentioned in the 12 interrogation video? Which they didn't take this. <laughs> Uh, now, this was photographed that was taken in the, uh, I guess it was in the, the crime scene, the crime scene, and that's the that came out to photographs. I don't remember who it was, but yes, someone did on the end. Wasn't it different from the, uh, the extraction, the phone extraction expert? Was it someone different? I think. Yes, and remember that's a month later. And then on that same day, uh, the same time, we took this photograph as well, which is a uh, identification card. Yes. Sorry, what is that? Um, I believe it's from holding the baseball bat. And is that an injury to your hand? It's a bruise. Uh, was that taken? Uh, February, was it February twenty third, twenty twenty, when the investigators came out? On the February twenty fourth. I'd like to introduce certification uh, law. Okay. It was pre marked to defense R will be received into evidence without objection. It's defense 13. Yes.
Yes. As a composite of the events that occurred in relation to George Floyd and TV. Yes. 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 Are those stills of a videotape? Yes. Is that videotape? Is it on your phone? Yes. So law enforcement see the phone that you had access to this video? I believe so, yes. And tell me about it. Um, Lucas likes to watch cartoons and play video games on the big screen, which is this is the big screen and um I would have to call Brian to come over sometimes to help me figure out the fire stick and whatever platform or whatever whatever it was that Lucas was trying to view his uh, shows and video games on. And I don't remember how um, uh, George found out that Brian had come over, I believe because it was actually fixed. He knew that I didn't know how to do it. Um, found out that Brian had come over to fix it and was he jealous of Brian? I don't know if he was jealous of Brian I think that he had a fear that I somehow would go back to Brian so I think by Brian helping me with things for Lucas um, he just didn't want him to be interacting with me at all so Lucas was um, he may have been. I can't remember if he actually fixed the television for me. This. I, I know he was for a fact, yes. Chances are you? Probably so, yes. Okay. I agree. So, how did it end up? That um, he accused me of sucking Brian's dick and told me that he was going to break my faith that that he was going to make me unrecognizable to my son with the bat and then told me that he's going to destroy my fucking television and then I was going to remove it from the uh, and if I didn't I was going to be again unrecognizable to my son so he grabbed the bat Absolutely, he already had had that in his hand, and he told me that I had to videotape it. Did you videotape the ball there? Yeah. Uh, there is a video, but I'm going to go ahead and ask you if you'd like to introduce this identification of these five photographs into the evidence. Okay. Is it O or N? I have O in the composite with five photos. I have a single photo. We will move in and out. Okay. All right, what was pre marked as O will be received into evidence without objection as defense 14. going to help him in either way of taking a part for your game. Okay, what do you think of it? I'm destroying my television.
without objections, defendants 15. Um, this is my living room. Um, this wall that we have over here with the heart, um, that's where we would display all the artwork here on the possible taking it down to add more. Um, so we could continue to be entertained. The bookshelf over here is my son's bookshelf, all of the toys, little guns, and uh, musical instruments. We've got a little period machine down here, a guitar. The stand right here with the red button on it, that was the television stand. And then my back porch area and then the dog right here. Okay. And then just like the front of the bookshelf, it's a baby gate, but um, my dogs would wander upstairs sometimes and go to the bathroom sometimes when we couldn't get them out. So I would at night time, um, or whenever we weren't home, make sure that they didn't go upstairs. And plus, Penny was blind. <laughs> Apparently. Or got any suitcase upstairs and push it down the stairs? Supposedly. Is that a book? Absolutely not. Is that bookshelf served in any way? No, nor the plant next to it. I'm showing you composite, two photographs, identification M. Did you look at those two and see if you recognize them? Yes, this is me sitting on the back porch with my dogs. And as you can see that, we are both drinking. All right, who's taking the picture? I guess it's George's, or maybe it's from that Lucas. Um, Lucas from them here, so it had to be George. How can you tell you all drink? Because there's a cup here, and then he has a beer. And uh, two dogs, one sitting next to you, what is that? That's Penny, she's the blind dog. I used to have to put her somewhere so she would stay there, because she um, wasn't familiar with the area, but she moved from there to the um, town. So most of the time, Penny would be closed or next to me. Who's next to the Um, This is little guard dog pest. Um, she was the death dog. Uh, and this is the fence here. Wow, I'll show you. Okay. Um, but this is Tess, and this is Pet. Death, blind. Penny and Tess. Uh, the second. This is Tess on the back porch. Take a nap. She was never far from me. Alright, could you want so how did he treat the dog? Nice. I don't know if he's a pet person, but I mean, he was he was nice. I needed him to feed him, they would feed him. Were there times when George was drinking? Was he a threat in the arm of all? All the time. Have you ever felt your one of the worst, one of the worst threats was 
Penny being blind, um, he would um, actually paint over his back. He wouldn't threaten me to do it. He would actually do it. Um, on nights that I had to go up to sleep or some, I, I fled the night before or something. Uh, and would tell me that he hoped that I would come back and find her bloated body dead in the pond across the way from our townhome. And Tess was notorious if I wasn't there to go look for me and would say that I, he would hope that I would have to scrape up her dead body from the, the street that was out in front of our uh, apartment complex. Why would you have accepted me? Why would he threaten to hold it up? Anything that he could get to try to just have some type of hold over me. Control. And he knew I loved my dogs very much. Especially that they were handicapped. Were they afraid of him? Yes. Uh, Penny would hear his voice and instantly go underneath um, the dining room table that we had. Um, Tess was always fractious and very, very quick, quick with movements, but she was never, never far. Away. They never show their teeth, they never growl, test occasionally bark, but it's very rare. And he used to kick them and just for what reason would he kick them? Penny would try to find me because she's she's blind. Blind at all. Sustained. I don't have to do identification for any others. Any objection? With pre marked as M will be received into evidence without objection as defense 16. Can you start with the jury? This is again for that porch, and this is the that I made for the dog to have a little bit extra space. Um, Penny is next to me. She's the line dog, and Ted is down here at the dark gate. Are you the state friend of the Yes. Um, I used to call my son when he was a baby. He was my bunny rabbit. Yes. Oh. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, he was my bunny rabbit, so I used to collect bunnies, bunny rabbits, and so I have rabbits. Here and there throughout my house and um, in my little garden area. So this is the alcohol dog too? Yes. Uh, and this is a uh, Which one? This is Tess. She's the deaf dog. How old is this dog? Uh, 23. So, maybe 9, maybe 10. <laughs> Yes. All right, members of the jury, it's four. It's four oh three. Uh, by a show of hands, would you like to take an afternoon break at this point in time? Okay, court sees no hands. Um, we may have to work also a little bit past five o'clock, maybe going between five forty-five and six this evening. I know, juror uh, third from the right, 
uh, you may have to make a phone call to that. Does anyone have any concerns about working a little bit later today until 6 o'clock? If you have those concerns, please raise your hand at this time. Our court sees no hands. Ma'am, are you in a position to step out to see if uh, we can get assistance with child care, or is that not an option for today? Um, I'm actually all set for today. She's already taken them off. You are? Okay. All right. Excellent. Very good. Thank you very much. I appreciate you all. With that, Mr. Owens, you may continue. Yes, sir. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, juror fit from the right. Did I tell you what? Let's go ahead and take it at this time. Uh, we'll give you all a 15 minute recess. It's 404. Hang on, hang on. Don't leave yet. I got to tell you a couple things. <clears throat> it's 404. We'll see you back here at 420. Same instructions before. Please don't conduct any independent investigation or research as the person, places, things, or charge involved. And don't have any discussions amongst yourselves or anyone else. We'll see you in a couple minutes. Thank you very much. Jerry, Thank you. If Ms. Boone needs to use the facilities, we might as well take advantage of that at this time. All right, court will be in recess until 420. Thank you. All right, we're back on the record. Case number 2020 CF2603, State of Florida versus Sarah Boone. State. Big catch for all happened today. William J. The State. Defense. Jim Boone. Ms. Booth, let's go ahead and bring you back up to uh, the witness stand, please. Yes, sir, that's the plan. Thank <laughs> you. 
Are we ready to bring back in our jury? Yes. All right, let's do it. Oh, okay. Hold on. Oh, she's up there. I'm sorry. I thought we lost it. Seated, thank you. Again, members and jury, you could. Oh, <laughs> Can the parties approach for a moment? Right, members of the jury, again, if you could just raise your hands to confirm that you complied with the court's instructions during the last break. Uh, the record will reflect all hands have been raised. All right, with that, uh, Mr. Owen, you may continue your inquiry, sir. Just, just, quickly, court statements. Identification A, this is one of the photographs that we introduced. Is this the, is this, you see it here? Yes. <laughs> And then this is your, your living room. This is uh, identification C. Identification D. TV. Thank <laughs> you. 
Y'all may have been out on the back patio, and uh, you had suggested to George that call the children. Did he call his brother? His brother called George, do you remember? George called his brother. Did you hear that? Okay. Um, you made a statement about Kelly. Tell him something. Tell, explain that to the to the jury. Um, I told him to tell his brother about you choking me the other day. This is a separate choking incident. Um, we had been drinking, and I had I wanted George to tell him, but he didn't tell him, so I. He said it in the background. So he can be aware. What did you Tell him why you choked me. Or that you choked me. Now. You heard the testimony of the two days the boys that lived next to you? Yes. You heard that they were they were asking questions about the um, the audio. They were audio interviews and heard from Detective Thompson. I think it was two a couple of days later on the twenty fifth of February or twenty seventh of February. Yes. And uh, you heard their testimony earlier this week. Yes. Or they you were made. Something said I was talking the top steps and he had the bottom? Yes. Have they got the night ball? Yes. So it was one of the So it was the night before. Um, again, I was sleeping and in the middle of the night, the door barricaded. He came in and ripped me out of the bed. Um, and First got me with one hand and then both got both hands and pulled me completely off of the bed and then like a caveman had my hair like this and was going down the stairwell, taking me with them um, to come downstairs so um, I could sit and pray with them. Do you believe that's the noise that the uh, two naked boys were? I absolutely. And it was just the night before? Correct. Now, some of the time when this abuse occurred, you called the police. And in other times, the police went on. I will refer to you the first time I believe you mentioned the 911 call. I believe that was July 25th of 2018. Yes. And uh, that was the incident in which Georgia kicked you in the eye. Stop. Stop. And you had grabbed his neck. Yes, I was able to uh, get my arms off and pinning me down with his knees and grab his neck. So law enforcement came and uh, investigated. Yes. They both of you were arrested. Correct. You were called asking to the officer when you were arrested? Why am I being arrested? Many times, yes. Do you, do you recall asking the 
the office. Why am I being arrested? Yes. And do you recall making any other statements to law enforcement as to why you did what you did to George? That was the first time ever that I actually officially thought that. Did you tell the officer that you were fighting back? Yes, because I was in great shock that I was getting arrested because of it. Now on the um, the two minute video, the suitcase video, you mentioned to him. I think you said something. I can't breathe. He said I can't breathe, and you said that's how I feel when you're choking. Were you referring to an isolated incident of the, the night before, two nights before, or whatever? Or were you referring to injured? Injured more than two or three, four times that he had done it. Okay. And then, uh, what about cheating? He didn't physically cheat. No, he's not. Okay, just, I, I don't want to go into a lot of what are you referring to now? Uh, George was, I believe, addicted to pornography, and a lot of that would be found on my phone from him supposedly wanting to call up job interviews. And uh, as a solution, I sat him down and I explained to him, to me, that's visualizing yourself with someone else, um, or at least having a pleasurable moment with someone else or watching other people. And to me, I told him that I considered that Okay, and so he, he would download that on your phone? Yes. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Yeah, jump, jump, jump. Has anyone who has ever been in love or when you love someone or primarily someone or something, you go above and beyond and you tolerate and you endure and you persevere and you try to make that person, person as spectacular as you possibly can no matter the sacrifice that you may have to go through um, to serve someone else. Um, in a positive light so that they can be better people for um, themselves and to just make them a happier person. And love, love is very strong and love is very deep. And love, I believe, is not fully understood in a lot of ways for how different people react to it. And I very much deeply and passionately love George. I love him to this day. Did you not want to be alone? Um, at the beginning um, through my divorce, um, it was very nice to have him around, and he was he was a man man to me, and um, I felt protected and very nice. And as my parents used to compliment me, and it makes. It made my day. So, yes. During that period of time, when uh, we first started seeing George, would it be fair to say that you had low self esteem? Yes. <clears throat> now, we talked about this previous arrest where. You told the officer you were fighting back and you got arrested. Now we'll talk about the conversations with all of us. But first I want to ask you, why did you go to the police station that day when you were interrogated and we saw the two hour video? Um, 
The day of the incident, um, the detective also gave her business card with her personal cell phone number on it and said if I happen to remember anything or anything that I would like to add to the day for me to uh, not hesitate to give her a call. So throughout the rest of the evening, I just, something was off. I, I didn't feel comfortable with what she told me and how she told it to me. How long did you have to see? Gosh, all day. From the moment that they were there to the moment that the coroner's van um, drove off. When, when it ended, did you stay in your home? No. I raced inside and collected some pajamas and a toothbrush, and I um, went over to where my son was at my ex husband's house. Did you break the doll? I didn't even feed them. It was so fast. Uh, and then once you got over your uh, ex husband, what happened? Is it relates to Detective Com? Com. Something just wasn't sitting right with me, and I, I had a suspicion that she just wasn't being honest with me, so I took it upon myself. Um, Sustained. So you call her. Tell, tell us about that. Um, I called her and I told her that I felt that she was being dishonest with me. Um, she originally had told me that due to her being pregnant, it would just be a lot easier for her to have me come down to the station um, to pick up my phone. The original plan was for she and uh, Detective Buck to return the phone to my apartment. Um, but she said that um, it would be a lot easier for me to just come down and pick it up because I remember when I was pregnant. That's what she said. You remember when you were pregnant. So um, I said, I feel like you're tricking me. I feel that you're being very sneaky about something. I don't believe that you're being honest with me. And I said, regardless, I'm still going to come. Sustain. So you agreed to come, but you understood it was to get your phone? Correct. All right, you came that afternoon to the station? I did. And the original agreement was there with the company. Correct. Fine. When you got to the station, what happened? Um, I, I was just going to be looking at my phone. I had, I mean, my car was there. I had to clean the car. It was just regular. I was just going to go and maybe sign something and pick up my phone. And there's people that are um, over here in the windows. And I thought that I was supposed to go over there to get my phone. And phone came down and um, said that my phone was upstairs. So if I would just follow him upstairs, that's where my phone was. And then I was taken into a, I guess, an interrogation room and they told me to sit down and that um, then I guess the interview or interrogation began. I just ended up getting my phone. See you. Tell me very white. Yeah. You may proceed. Miss Ben. Miss Ben. Tell the jury why you lied to the police. I lied to the police. Basically, I did because I was extremely fearful of being arrested. I made the first attempt at me calling 911 by telling them what happened and I thought that they were going to help me but instead I was arrested for calling my mom. So you made the decision to lie? I did. Did you stay with that lie? I did. Are you telling the truth today? I am. Now let me take you back to the uh <coughs> To the sense of it. Is it fair to say that George Torres is sober 
Is that fair to say? Yes. Is it fair to say that every time that you've been or every time that you're hit by him or harmed by him, it's going to be intoxicated? Yes. As a result, when he's drinking, does it change more? Yes. Can you explain that to me? I'm always fearful, um, paranoia. I what? Because I try to protect and defend myself for fear something happens at the last ultimate second. But you're always that way, fearful. Is it because of these prior incidents? Do you try to play games? All the time. What do you do? I look at the puzzles and the painting and feeding the ducks across the way of the pond, um, listening to music, trying to go for a walk on the trail, anything I possibly can. I told her I was running out of things to entertain them with. What one did George with? What what box? Sustained. Does he tell you? What do you call it? Sustained. That's a result of how he behaves towards you in that intoxicated state. How would you feel on the night of this event? Okay. Extremely nervous, um, anxiety, or just I never relax when he's drinking. Yes, and the state of intoxication that he was at at the time of this event is that the state that scares you the most. <clears throat> It's the tone, yes. There's a lot of alarms and red flags that go on throughout the day, or night, or whenever it is that we are drinking. Tell, tell us about tell us about that. How that heightens does that heighten your sense of safety? At times. But especially when he's drinking? Oh yes. All the time. And then his mood? Yes, it depends on what mood he's in that day. So we, have, we have like six cents of how he's doing? Yes, I knew George very well. Um, okay. Can you tell us what you mean by that? Six cents, I knew, knew him very well. That I was trained by fear with him, just it, it wasn't fun anymore when we were drinking. We would uh, hang out on the back porch. It wasn't fun anymore because I knew inevitably that something was going to happen to me one way or another. You know, those, those bruises that we saw of him, they look pretty deep. Tell the jury what you were thinking. From the bathroom? Yes. I didn't want to die that night. I, I can't describe it to you. It's terrifying love to a certain degree where 
my plans to show him the next day and just I I wanted him to be better and treat me nicer and be the person that he was when I originally met him and I knew that was in him still. I knew that it could be found and I just couldn't figure out what it was that I was doing wrong in order for it to not be back to where that was and I was tired of living in fear and just sick all the time of figuring out how I can entertain him so I don't die and uh, continue a relationship with my son and try to live a normal life. That wasn't a normal life for me. And just, I, I thought of mine as if it was going to die. I would, have, I would have died or I would have been disfigured or maimed or if, if it weren't me with a bad, it would have been him. If he was with God now. Any cross examination? Does George know somebody named Crystal? Did you ever mention Crystal in your text messages about being one of the bitches? Don't know. I don't remember. How about Christine? Did George know Christine? I don't know. How about Pamela Erickson? These may have been people that he was communicating with on whatever the platform was. On your phone? I'm going to say yes. Did you find these communications? I've only found one or two of them from some of them. And did you send a long letter to his family that's related to him about George and his girls and his cheating on you? I believe so. Okay, so you do, you do know those things, right? I don't remember that it's been however long. Okay. Now, on February 24th, 2020, you called 911 about 1 p.m., correct? Yes. And at that point, you were still feeling a little intoxicated, were you not? It was more shock, yes. So you agree that you previously stated I was still, I believe, intoxicated to a degree? To a degree, yes. So 1 p.m., that's about 15 hours after 11 p.m. The night before, correct? I'm guessing so. Well, 12 hours prior would be 1 a.m., and then 12 a.m. is 13 hours, 11 p.m. is 14 hours, correct? Okay. And you were present here for the medical examiner, Dr. Zadovich, to testify, correct? Yes. And you heard her talk about all the effects of ethanol that it has on the human body, correct? Yes. And she also mentioned something that it on average, dissipates at about 0. 0.015 an hour. Do you recall that? I believe so. Okay. So, oh. what do you care to say? That you're still, still feeling the effects of alcohol at 1 p.m., so it's 14 hours. We were at approximately about 0.21 11 p.m. the night before. Do you feel like you were two and a half times the legal limit at that time? I don't know how you came to that number. Just not comfortable. Approach.
You may proceed. So you testified earlier that you all had about half one of these bottles left in the night before, correct? Yes. So, would you agree that this is one of the three bottles that was purchased between February 22nd and two that were purchased on February 23rd? I'm guessing it is like yes. Alright, and it's 1.5 liters. Would you agree? Yes. And when you say half, we're talking about the top of the label was left from the day before? No, but this now. Right, for the last halfway of the label? Right about. Okay, about half. So in addition to half the way through the label, which we began consuming after going to talk at about 12 15, correct? Oh, yeah. So you all would have been began consuming around. 12.30, say we got that. I can't Okay. And after finishing what you all had left over from Saturday, the two of you consumed two 1.5 liter bottles, correct? I'm not sure about the second bottle that you purchased, if it was empty or not, mm-hmm. at the time. Well, you did mention that the police would find two empty bottles in the top of your trash, correct? Yes. And we did all see that in photographs, correct? See that two. in the garbage, yes. yes. All right. You say you were about 100 pounds at the time? Yes. And we all know Mr. Torres was 103 pounds at the time of his death, correct? That's what he said. All right. So that's three liters of wine between... 200 pounds split between two people over the course of a day, correct? Yes. And you testified uh, today that you were intoxicated uh, at the time that this occurred, uh, the videos between 11 and 11.30 at night, correct? Yes, at some level, yes. Right. Now, what does that mean to you? Previously, have you indicated that that means the room is spinning? Do, do you ever recall saying that? I so what was your level of intoxication at, at this point in time when the first video was filmed at 11, 12? Do you mean from lack of sleep or alcohol? From the alcohol. What was my level? What were you feeling? Did you have trouble with your balance? I was more tired than anything. Did you have trouble with your balance? I don't believe so. So you were able to flip a suitcase over with a 100-pound man in it, right? And it happened. Okay. How about your speech? Do you feel like your speech was slurred? Clearly. How about your inhibitions? Do you feel like you were doing things that you wouldn't do when you were sober? I wasn't thinking about that. Well, on reflection, do you feel like there was something you would have done when you were sober? In George. I'm just asking you, looking back on this, when he's in the suitcase and you're telling him how you feel, and then you wait 11 minutes and you film another 22 seconds, and then you go upstairs, upon reflection, is that something you would have done and left him in there had you not been drinking? I don't know. I can't say. Okay. If I was scared, it would be something. Okay. All right. Now, today you testified about the time frame between the two videos, correct? Yes. So you came down from the shower where you were hiding, correct? Yes. And as you're coming down the stairs, before you even get to the bottom of the stairs, you can kind of see over your shoulder or towards your right that he's trying to hide in the suitcase, correct? 
Yes. And the lid is down, but it's not closed, and you can you can tell it's high in there. It's not very tight in spot yet, right? Correct. And so you come over to him, and you're laughing, right? Yes. And you move the suitcase around some before zipping it shut, right? No. No? You immediately zip it shut? Yes. Okay. And you're both still laughing about it, correct? Correct. All right. And then it's during this course of time, how quickly is it after you zip it shut that you begin filming the first video? I don't know without watching it. I don't, I don't know. Okay, I mean, the video's not going to catch you zipping them up because you're like 10 feet away, right? How, how quickly after you zip them up is it before the video starts? That's my question. I don't know. Okay. And then during that 9 minutes and 14 seconds is when he begins to get angry, correct? What 9 minutes? Between the two videos. There's 9 minutes and 14 seconds between the end of 1061 and uh, the beginning of 10, 6, or 1062 and 1063. So you got the two minute, three second video that starts at 11, 12, 45, correct? I, I guess. Permission to use state 17? You bet. Zero seven. That indicates, uh, according to your own attraction, two twenty three, twenty twenty, eleven twelve, forty five p.m. Image underscore n sixty two will be begin being captured. And we've seen that that is about two minutes and three seconds. Entry three one 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 three indicates that image underscore ten sixty three dot move. One 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 three. A second movie is captured at eleven twenty three oh three p.m. Your testimony was that after that first video was captured by your phone and you, Mr. Torres began getting angry and trying to push his way out. Correct. Between these two movies, of which there are about nine minutes and fourteen seconds, Mr. Torres begins to get angry and try and push his way out and get out of the suitcase. Correct. He had been angry on and off throughout the entire day. Okay. You didn't tell us that earlier. You said it was a wonderful, fun day all day, correct? That's because I lived. Okay. But you did not tell us earlier today that he had been angry throughout the day. When would I say that? You described your entire day of 
doing puzzles, arts and crafts, and outside by the dark board, and you said it was a wonderful day and everything was fun uh, until he was in the suitcase. Did you not testify to that earlier today? I did. Okay. My specific question between these two movies is, this is when he begins to get angry and trying to push his way out and get out of the suitcase, correct? Okay. And he was expressing his anger in what manner? How did he say this? Ma'am, you know very well that I'm talking about between these movies. Please answer my question. Between these two movies, how did he express his anger with you? Tell me that I was going to fucking die. Okay. Now, this is happening after he's already told you several times he cannot breathe in the suitcase, correct? Correct. And he's been in there for whatever brief amount of time it took you to zip him up, and it's the laughter stops, and you go over and begin to film, correct? Yes. And you're filming. Your purpose of filming is to kind of teach him a lesson. This is your chance to say something to him when he can't say anything back to you, correct? No. Correct. There was no lesson to be learned. It was just I wanted him to try to understand how I felt so maybe he could progress in being a better person the next day. So... You want him to understand how you felt in the past, and that's not uh, teaching a lesson? I just want you to understand. Okay. All right. So immediately prior to zipping him up and putting him into the movie, you had been upstairs, correct? I'm sorry? Immediately to come before coming down and, and zipping him up and then filming the first of the two movies, you had been upstairs in the shower, correct? Yes. I'm going to publish what has been labeled as image underscore 1061, which according to the timeline is captured at 11.03 p.m. for one second per device. All right. Does this appear to be the suitcase that's in question in the two movies that are filmed at 11, 12, 11, 23 p.m.? Okay. This is image 1061 taken at 11. 3 p.m. 31 seconds. Does this appear to be the blue suitcase that's in the two videos that were captured at 11, 12, 11, 3 p.m.? Correct. Did you take this image at 11, 3 p.m.? I, I don't remember if I did or not. And again, we had, um, and by the way, I mean you and Mr. Torres, two 1.5 liter bottles of wine plus whatever was left over from the day before, correct? Correct. So, we don't remember taking this photograph? I don't. Do you remember whether or not this before it was in here? I don't remember taking the photo. Okay. So, what is your memory of what happens between 11.03 p.m. and 31 seconds when that image is captured? And then when the movie starts at 11.12.45, what do you remember? I don't. Okay. Do you remember anything from that night? I do. You told the police on February, or February 25th, 2020, and they first showed you the video, but you didn't remember taking that. Do you remember that? In your testimony, you do remember taking that video. I do. 
So you don't want to take that photograph nine years prior. That's right. Is there something that you have more to drink in those nine minutes? That's not. Was Mr. Torres in that suitcase the entire time between 11.03 when that image was taken and then when the second video was taken at 11.23 p.m.? I believe so, yes. So for 20 minutes? Yes. How long the time frame is? Did he begin telling you that he couldn't breathe before the video or do you not remember? I don't remember. Now, you testified moments ago that um, your two neighbors must have misremembered which night the loud noise was, correct? Yes. And now you're telling us that you don't remember taking the photograph at 11 03 p.m., correct? Correct. Did the police come out to your uh, townhouse on Sunday, February 23rd, 2020? Yes. I'm talking about Sunday. This is the Sunday fun day when we were to public twice. Were the police out of your residence? No. It was the day after, Monday the 24th. Correct? Yes. And that Monday morning, you called 911 Monday afternoon at about 1 p.m., correct? Yes. And between that time frame, you were the only person in your apartment, plus Mr. Torres in the suitcase, correct? Yes. So if anything had been disturbed in your apartment, if you had all the time that you wanted to, to undisturb them before calling 911, correct? If I wanted to. Okay. And you still, your testimony is there was no loud boom that shook the walls of your townhouse at about 11 p.m. the night of February 23rd, 2020, correct? Correct. To your correct. Now, that second video is 22 seconds where you just hear him say Sarah and you don't say anything or you're familiar with that video, correct? Yes. It's after that that you go upstairs, correct? Yes. How quickly is it to go upstairs after that? It was pretty quick. Can we grab the dogs? No, the dogs were upstairs already. Okay. Did you uh, call 911 and let the police know that you had zipped somebody shut in a suitcase and they had not been able to get out for 20 minutes? I did not. Did you go to Brian's house and tell him I had zipped Mr. Torres up in a suitcase shut? Um, we need to do something about that before the past. I believe that's what the phone call was. Okay. So what do you remember now about the phone call with Brian? I I think I don't know I don't know specifically what it was about. Now, your testimony, it seems like you spend day after day finding things to entertain Mr. Torres to do the prayer. Yes, sir. Almost like having a child. You have you have your own child, correct? I do. What you described sounded like having a small child. Would you agree? That's your expectation. <laughs> well, you take him from doing arts and crafts to doing puzzles, so on and so forth, correct? When he's been drinking, yes. <laughs> and Mr. Torres was notorious for doing some of these things, correct? What do you mean? Well, you described. Mr. Torres is being notoriously known for doing things. You described your ex-husband, Brian Boone, notorious for doing things like nagging and calling all the time. Do you remember your testimony calling people notorious for doing things? Yes. What would you say people say you are notorious for? I don't know. And you would not answer Brian Boone, your ex-husband's phone calls, just so that you could let him know that you're busy and you have things going on. Correct. I mean that at whatever time it was that he was calling me, that he could wait for the few moments of me getting up 
to where they just gets out of school and they go and take a Okay. So if you would return this call, you would let me call several times, correct? That day, yeah. Okay. How about other days? Would you have to call to remind you to get focused on other days? He wasn't reminding me. He was just making sure that this was was covered for a pickup or drop off. Sorry. You can mention uh, to the sheriff's office either February 24th or February 25th about going to Publix with Mr. Torres at noon for 1217, did you? I don't recall. So the best, the best step is that would be the recording of those interviews? Correct. Did you not remember going to Publix with Mr. Torres that day? At what point? At any no, I didn't. You uh, had indicated to the police that um, it was about 4 p.m. that you all had started drinking and doing chores. Do you recall that? I do. And your testimony today was that it was really more after you got published at about 12 to 17 p.m., correct? Yes. And you did not tell the truth, correct? I'm sorry. You did not tell the, tr- the truth to the police about that, correct? I did not. And when they were asking you about Mr. Forrest's injuries, you told them that you had nothing to do with it, correct? Yes. And that was not the truth. Correct. I'll have breakfast on the end of one third. I don't remember. Did y'all have lunch? I believe we had leftovers from the thing, something that we had in the fridge. Do you recall the work? No, not at this point, no. And then I believe you mentioned having a sandwich of some sort for dinner? No, those were, I'm guessing. He and I ate at the same time. <laughs> and at one point, Mr. Torres called his brother Juan, correct? Yes. And do you admit that you were yelling in the background, telling Mr. Torres to tell his brother that he had been joking him? I don't know if I was yelling. I know that I he could hear me through the phone. So, how long did that been going on that day? When did you start uh, getting on Mr. Torres' joking in the past? I had, he and I had had conversations about it. Um, because he didn't remember doing it to me. And uh, the next day, day up. Is it fair to say that there are just points in time when you don't remember what to do either, correct? I think uh, it's five years ago. I'm talking about from drinking. Is it fair to say that you don't often remember things that you did while you were drinking? I would not say often. Okay. In the course of your relationship with Tor, is there anything we don't remember happening happened the night before between you and I can't say that at this point. But you said that you don't remember taking that photograph at 11 3 p.m. on February 23rd, correct? Yes. Was there anything else that you were telling Mr. Torres that he needed to tell his brother? Not that I can recall. Was there anything you were telling him that he needed to tell his daughters? Not that I can recall. (laughs) 
Now you indicated that Mr. Torres could use your phone to look at pornography. Correct. Were there ever any points in time when it was you? Was you looking at pornography? Um, if I was, it was to go back and look to see. Did you ever threaten to get Mr. Torres arrested if he did not do what he wanted him to do? I wouldn't say threaten. Okay. Well, were there ever points in time where you would like him to call you or return a call? And if he didn't do that, um, you would threaten to get arrested? It depends on if he had my keys or something that I needed from him. Okay. And you're talented, right? Mine, yes. Flush out. Well, you, when did you get him off the lease? Um, I'm not sure what um, year it was, but I don't think he was actually removed from the lease. Okay. He was made a big type of tenant. And did you change locks so that you couldn't get back in at the point of time when you came out? I and then did you leave the key in the hiding spot that you were aware of? There were multiple hiding places. Okay. On any of the 911 calls, did you ever mention that Mr. Torres was aware of where you kept your keys and that's how you got back to the house? No, I needed to. Okay. He would never break into my home. All right, it's your testimony that you did not push him down the stairs, correct? Yes. And, in fact, it was him that dragged you down the stairs the night before, correct? Yes. Now, by drag, did you leave your feet? Yes. And did you get scrapes on your knees or anywhere from the carpet? I'm not sure. Did you get any injuries, like bruises or scrapes or scrapes? Um, I was missing a, a lot of my hair. Yes, that was on the stairwell. Okay. And you agree that you were photographed on February 24th when the police came out, correct? The day of the Well, after the incident, we're not sure when he passed. Yes. Some of those photographs show ashtrays inside your house. I thought you said that you smoke inside your house. We cut it. But you did. Right? Can you agree you could go to the hospital and tell them things that were not true, correct? Yes. There are times where you go to the hospital and leave without getting treatment, correct? Yes. Is it fair to say that you often had alcohol in your system when you were going to the hospital, correct? Sometimes. All right, so just to summarize the day, make sure we understand it. You all wake up sometime in the morning, but it's an unknown time, correct? On February 23rd. Or early afternoon. I yes, I had a problem with the detectives and then having me guess Okay. Are you the kind of person like most of us that uses your phone when you wake up? No. So the first activity on your phone may have nothing to do with when you woke up. Is that fair for you? Yes, so I've been looking at the time. <laughs> okay. So at some point you wake up, it doesn't sound like you have breakfast, correct? Right. You do some chores. Correct? Yes. So that is true. That part of it is true. You did do chores before going to Publix at 1217? Yes. All right. After chores, you go to Publix and you get that 1.5 liter Magnum bottle of Woodford Chardonnay, correct? I'm not sure what Magnum is. 1.5 liters. Instead of the 750s, it's the double size. It's like two bottles of wine. So you got a 1.5 liter, right? Yes, it was the larger bottle. And you got home. And you at 100 pounds, and Mr. Torres at 103 pounds began drinking this wine, correct? I'm, I'm guessing so, I'm not. So I guess times. Well, don't guess. I mean, you got home from Publix. When was your first drink? 
I'm not sure. I mean, we could have continued to do uh, whatever was left over from what we didn't do before we went to Publix. Okay. So you may have tried to start a drinking even later, right? Then 12.30 when we get back to Publix. I, 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 I don't know. Okay. Was it one thirty or 2.30 when we began drinking? I don't know. All right. Was it before any of the phone calls, the brothers and his daughters? Yes. And so you drink what's left in the back, the bottom one from the day before that's halfway labeled, correct? At some point. And then you drink 1.5 liters of wine, and he goes out and gets another one on his own without your permission or suggestion about 5.30, correct? Correct. And then you all consume that one as well and it ends up in the trash can at the end of the night, correct? Apparently. Okay. At what point in the night does your memory tape stop? You described that it wasn't on at 11.03 p.m. when that photograph was taken. What's the last thing you actually do remember prior to these videos being made? I, I don't recall it at the point. I, I don't remember. Okay. All right. And so... It ends in hide and seek after arts and puzzles, right? <laughs> he says, tag, you're it, but you run and go upstairs and hide, right? Yes. So does that mean he's it? He's supposed to come find you? No. Oh. So you both hide? No. Okay. How does this work? Okay. I, I don't know how to tell you. I, okay. I was it, and I, I wouldn't be it. I mean... My understanding of the rules of hide and seek is one person will be it, come and convert her eye, have like 20, and then go find the person that's hiding. Is that your familiarity with the rules too, or you guys have house rules? Cool. I understand how the. Okay. So, explain me what was your expectation. You go up to the shower, were you expecting him to come find you? Yes. Okay. And after a while, he did not come find you. Yes. And that's when you return downstairs. Right. And because of the way your townhouse is set up, you can kind of see over where the suitcase is and that he's trying to hide in there, but it's not successfully hidden just yet. I mean, come down a good way. It's in order to be able right. to. But you saw him. You testified that before you got the pot. Yes. All right. And then you come over there, and thinking that it's funny, you zip them shut, correct? Yes, we don't like it's funny. Okay. The defendant uh, standing up. Entering the well. Yes. Yes. Deputy. Proof of leaser into the well, please. Okay. All right. Can you help me 
understand how it was that the zip is shut. You show us where you say you left. Uh, you open and that up. Would it be easier to put it down here? Uh, I didn't want to make you go down there. If you, 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 you're happy doing that, all of it. Hold up. Hold up. Does she need to warn Bob? Yes. Agreed. She's going to be manipulating it. Just demonstrate how she did the shot. Okay, well, first of all, we have a wet. The first thing. Objection. Yep.
Objections overruled. Before we read it, can we see how the two zipper parts were positioned when you say that Mr. Torres is able to get his hand out? If you want me to do it, I'm fine. I'll take your direction. Um, from what I remember, this is how we did the case. This is how we did the case. This is up here. This was not the part either. This one, like here. It's not over there? Where do you where do you You asked me where I said it. When when you say that it's zip shut, show it. Are you talking about how I did it or when you're done zipping it shut, he's inside of it where it's in person. Just to look at that. And it's the form. The form is what I mean. I mean, it's not. Yes, this is what I mean. Yes. Yeah. 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 How he was trying to put his hand out, it was like this from the corner of our Thank you. Did you ever change the position of those zippers once when you put it out? I and so once you zip into there. There's some amount of time that you don't remember specifically before you have start taking the two minute video, correct? Yes. And then that's when you say what you say, and that's when he says what he says. We've all heard it, correct? Yes. And then between there and that second video, 22 seconds length, it's at this point where he's beginning to get angry. And then that's when you take the baseball bat that's in evidence, and your testimony is started. Oh, end of it. Did you say this with the second video? Between the two videos, that's that's when you start hitting with the bat and he's getting angry and trying to escape, correct? Right, I was not hitting him, I was yes. Okay. Did you ever hit him with the bat while he's outside the suitcase? No. So each time that you hit the bat through this suitcase. Did that leave the mark on You didn't hit him in the back outside the suitcase, correct? Yes, you got to make it straight. No, the suitcase is for itself. Um, and then you take the second video and you go upstairs and go to bed, correct? I apparently went upstairs and I used the phone to make a phone call. Okay. And then I go upstairs. All right. And at the point in time when you left the one upstairs, he was still inside the suitcase, correct? Correct. Was he still asking for you and calling your name? Not that I can recall. Did you say shh to him again? I don't remember. Did you tell him that this was his problem and it's on you again? I don't remember. Did you do anything to help him escape from the predicament that you zipped him up in? No. No. Need redirect examination. 
Just to ask you the question that you, you poked him and you didn't poke him. You poked, every time you poked him hard with the, the bat, he was inside the briefcase. He's yes. Uh, the suitcase. But you remember when he put his hand out, did you not get him in the hand outside the suitcase? Yes. Okay. So that was the only time the bat touched Mr. Torres's body outside the suitcase. Yes. It was when you hit him with a hand. But all the other injuries were with you poking him pretty hard. I mean, you bruised your hand, correct? Doing it. Thank you. That's all. Ma'am, you can return to counsel's table. Judge. Just a moment. Let me, let, let me get her situated at table and then we can approach. All right, come on up, y'all. All right, members of the jury, thank you so much. It is 542. At this point in time, the court's going to go into recess for the evening. I thank you again for your continued service and your attention in this matter. We're going to start tomorrow again at 9 a.m. here in 12 Alpha at the Orange County Courthouse. I'll read you another instruction. I know you've heard it. I'm sure you're sick of it, but i got to keep reading it, so thank you. Jurors, you must not conduct any investigation on your own. This includes reading newspapers, watching television, or using a computer, cell phone, the Internet any electronic device, or any other means at all to get information related to this case or the people and places involved in this case. This applies whether you are at the courthouse, at home, or anywhere else. You must not visit places mentioned in the trial or use the internet to look at maps or pictures to see any place discussed during the trial. Jurors do not watch local news or read local newspapers. Jurors must not have discussions of any sort with friends family members, or even your fellow jurors about the case or the people and places involved. 
So do not let anyone make comments to you or ask questions about the trial. I want to stress again that justice, you must not talk about this case face to face. You must not talk about this case by using an electronic device. You must not use phones, computers, or other electronic devices to communicate. Do not send or accept any messages related to this case or your jury service. Do not discuss this case or ask for advice by any means at all, including posting information on an internet website, chat room, or blog. With that, members of the jury, I'm going to excuse you for the balance of the evening. Thank you so much. Thank you. With regard to these medical records, the court previously today had required by 5 p.m. to address those. Unfortunately, they have not yet been addressed. It is imperative that the state knows what it is we're culling down or redacting. And I understand that you may want to be seeking those in evidence maybe tomorrow. And the state needs to be advised what it is that you're seeking to utilize. So where are we in figuring that out? Do we have one minute left on? Yes, sir. claims that every time that he went to the hospital and the medical records would show that it was in relation to some type of domestic violence involving her, we, we've expressed to her that we do not wish to pursue it and introduce those records of George Floyd of his medical records of the different times he went as it relates to their difficulties. Do you understand that? Okay. Ma'am, earlier we had discussed. Anything else to add to that, uh, Mr. O? This is what I've explained to her that the lawyers make those decisions. Okay. And uh, I believe she's in agreement now. I just wanted to get it on the record. Understood. All right, so ma'am, I just got a couple follow up questions similar to other conversations we've had over the last couple of days. I don't want to know about the specifics of any conversations you've had with you and your attorneys, just whether or not you've had them. You recall earlier today I had asked you questions about certain rights that you had the ability to decide. Do you recall that conversation that we had, ma'am? It was before you testified. Um, yes. Okay. Do you recall that I advised you that the lawyers get to make most of the strategy determinations at trial? Do you recall that? And do you recall that you said you understood that? Yes. And do you also recall that I advised you of certain rights that you have? Do you recall that? And one of those rights was the right to testify or remain silent. Do you recall that? And did you understand that? So this decision uh, is a trial decision as to whether or not there's certain evidence that your are determinations at trial. Do you recall that? And do you recall that you said you understood that? Yes. And do you also recall that I advised you of certain rights that you have? Do you recall that? I do. And one of those rights was the right to testify or remain silent. Do you recall that? And did you understand that? So this decision uh, is a trial decision as to whether or not there's certain evidence that your lawyers are going to seek to utilize in your defense. Do you understand that? Yes. Do you understand that they're exercising that trial strategy at this time not to pursue those medical records? Okay. Do you have any questions about that? 
Are, are you on board with that strategy? Are you still on board with the strategy utilized in your defense? Are you satisfied with your lawyer's representation of you in this matter? Yes. All right. Thank you. State, anything else we need to address before we... Uh, my understanding, sorry, that's okay. My understanding is the last civilian witness they intend on calling is arriving at uh, M scale at nine oh three in the morning. Uh, it's either nine oh three or nine nine oh five. Yes. yes. Um, plan over the evening at five thirty. Okay. And then, just scheduling purposes, we're trying to figure out when we would need our um, rebuttal expert, Dr. Werner, to appear. I know Mr. Owens had said they were endeavoring to finish by Friday, but I don't know if Dr. Harper's availability issues for tomorrow is going to uh, change that anticipated time frame. Uh, I'll try to reach out to her by uh, text. That's usually how we communicate. But, um, well, assuming she testifies on Thursday, are you still in a position to rest on Friday, or would that kick us to the next week, sir? Well, no, I, I won't finish this week if at all possible. If I'm, I'm hoping that Dr. Harper could be here tomorrow when Dr. Brandon is here, but let's just say she she's tied up. Let's here. let's do worst case scenario. She's here Thursday morning. I think we can try to finish our case right then and, and give the state a chance to rebut. I would say Thursday. <laughs> Tim, my understanding is our expert can't be here in the afternoon on Thursday. I'm going to have to check her a bit. If you would be so kind, and we can address that tomorrow morning. Okay, anything else, State? Anything else from the defense? All right, All right. Court will be in recess. So, yes, sir. I'm sorry. Just to give everybody some scheduling, this might help. Everyone will schedule. There are going to be two officers here in the morning who are going to be ready to testify. There will also be some other witnesses, officers, like the, the detective who testified that I need to call back because of some impeachment issues of one of the witnesses. Um, so, and then we'll get into everybody else's witnesses. So, There's about, about three or four that I have in the morning time that we'll be proceeding on. And we'll go. Okay, all right, appreciate the lay of the land. All right, we will see you all. That's what one more, Mr. Yes, sir. This flying in from New Jersey, I think, is Wednesday at 9 a.m. Yeah. I think she's scheduled to fly out Thursday at 9 a.m. So if there's any way we can depose her, maybe in the morning or at lunch, and then have her testify on Wednesday afternoon. That, that's an unreasonable demand on my time, given everything I've been doing to make sure that we can get this pushed through. Um, I need to do things like get ready for expert cross examinations and other things that need to get accomplished at lunchtime. I'm happy to do it in the evening. My understanding is she was supposed to be coming in today, so that we could do it tonight, and that didn't happen. Um, but I, I think I think we may be forced to accommodate a lunchtime deposition. Any further? Uh, I'm just telling you what I'm for. Deposition will be at you know, 5.30 tomorrow, or at any other, if we've got to have it later, depending on how we go. We'll address it at that time. All right, thank you both very much. We will see you tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. Courts in recess.